and the web page. You know, the job seekers and the employment opportunity, this ratio is disproportionate in our country. So there is a huge competitive, you know, situation. But, uh, but the guidance, proper guidance in the right time, in the right place for the job aspirants and uh, early, you know, professionals, uh, is of paramount importance. An exposure of each of the above mentioned fields, like, as I mentioned, the different fields of work, which includes various aspects, I'm not going into the details of that, but an exposure of each of the field would be provided by eminent specialists from the respective job domains today, and I'm sure the deliberations and discussions would be very, very helpful for the participants uh, who are the main, you know, focused audience today in this webinar. And I definitely wish the webinar a great success. And thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to share my views with you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, sir, for always guiding us through thick and thin in the entire course. Now I am going to Dr. Priyadoshini Malik, ma'am, and I am requesting her to speak a few words and address the audience. Dr. Priyadoshini Malik is faculty in microbiology and one of the conveners of this webinar. Ma'am, please press the platform. Thank you, Devastuti. A very warm evening to our esteemed Vice Principal, sir, and our very own mentor, SB, sir. On behalf of the webinar committee, as a convener, I would like to extend my warm welcome to Mr. Bhaskar for giving us this pleasure of listening to you. Mr. Shujoy Banerjee, Group Chief People Officer and Group Head, Marketing Gainville Commissals Private Limited. Sir, it would be a privilege to hear from you. And Dr. Shupatra Shen, Associate Professor in Botany of Ashutosh College. Ma'am, the more I see about you, it feels less. I am sure most of us can't wait to get enriched by your words. It is a glorious moment for me as one of the conveners to extend my warm wishes on behalf of the webinar committee. I want to convey my heartfelt gratitude to our entire administration for accepting the invitation and presiding over this two days webinar on diverse careers, entry and sustainability. It is an opportune moment to refurbish and debate upon the various career opportunities, the webinar schedule brushes upon a spectrum of exciting and benefiting themes that discuss the various aspects of different career perspectives. The speakers would surely enlighten all of us present here on the importance of today's topic, its management, the various approaches, conversion or transitory situations, and how to use opportunities judiciously thus ensuring to carve a pathway of light for our future generations. Today, I am sure Mr. Bhaskar's view on career would be a piece of beneficial information adding to our existing knowledge. Once again, greeting to one and all. It gives me immense pleasure to grace all of your presence in the interest of the entire committee. It gives me tremendous contentment to be presenting the welcome speech amongst the most esteemed personalities who had already won accolades in their respective fields. Before we begin this webinar, I would like to express my heartfelt gratitude to all of you who sincerely committed to this event to make it a success. This event would have been impossible without the support of each and every one present here. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Madam, for your kind words. Uh, now, actually, due to some uh, technical errors, 
the first part could not be aired so i would like to repeat that now i would again want to welcome everyone to the two day webinar on diverse careers entry and sustainability organized by career counseling and training program cctp in collaboration with iqac and support from seminar committee ashutosh college our principal professor apurbo rai our vice principal professor apurbo rai inaugurated the session and kinds words of success and best wishes for the webinar were conveyed by professor dr manush kobi gb member and bursar ashutosh college and dr sriparna dr roy iqsc coordinator now i would request dr devustuti dashgupto to please continue with the session madam thank you priyanka now i would like to request shuroma bera faculty communicative english to introduce the seminar theme to all of us shuroma ma'am thank you devastuti ji a very good evening to one and all i would like to extend my warm welcome to our respected vice principal sir our bursar sir our iqsc coordinator ma'am and our very own sb sir uh now on behalf of the career counseling and training program unit of ashutosh college i welcome you all to this two day webinar titled diverse careers entry and sustainability choosing an appropriate career option is integral to a happy life we have all grown up hearing the question what you want to become when you grow up and that pretty much outlines the importance of a desirable career in our lives career options must be chosen keeping in mind one's values interests as well as skill set it's important to be happy doing what we do and that essentially brings us to the question what is it that we enjoy doing and would want to do for a living the answer to this question lies within us but there are always mentors to guide us and help us to explore within ourselves to find this answer that is exactly why we are here today to understand the opportunities and challenges associated with various career options in the corporate sector research media performing arts and the self employment sector and also to know for ourselves where we best fit into the puzzle the best part is that if we are wise enough to select the right career options for ourselves there would be no need for a fish to fly or a bird to swim and it is extremely important to be ourselves at a place where we spend more than half of our lives our work day so selecting a wrong career option can severely affect an individual's mental health while choosing the appropriate career option can lead to a healthy and contented life i hope this two day webinar titled diverse careers entry and sustainability jointly organized by the career counseling and training program unit ashutosh college and internal quality assurance cell of the college with support from the seminar committee would help our participants recognize their skill set their values and interests and help them think more clearly about the career options they would want to pursue thank you so much thank you shurama for the nice introduction to the theme now i am requesting priyanka ma'am to initiate academic session 1 of the webinar priyanka ma'am thank you madam now let us initiate the academic session for day 1 our first speaker for the session is mr j v bhaskar ifs 2006 batch conservator of forests wp and gis government of west bengal sir 
I would now request you to kindly share the platform with us. <clears throat> um, I think Mr. Bhaskar hasn't joined yet, so maybe you can introduce, you can give a brief about the uh, other two eminent speakers that we have today. By the time Mr. Bhaskar will join, then we will welcome him to deliver his lecture. Okay, Devastuti, madam, would you? Yes, ma'am. As sir has not joined, uh, I would like to tell that already we have done that uh, first is um, Vashka sir and then we have with us Shujai sir and then we have Shupatra ma'am from our own college. Let me tell the topic name. I am requesting Priyanka ma'am to tell the topic names of today's webinar. Hello, am I audible? Yes, yes, you are audible. Okay. So our first session uh, for the day is Dr. J.V. Bhaskar, and uh, he will talk on careers and administrative job. Our second speaker for the day, Mr. Shujai Banerjee, he will talk on careers in corporate world. And our third speaker for the session, Dr. Shupatra Sen, he will, she will talk on research as a career. We are waiting for our speaker, Mr. Bhaskar. Please bear with us for a few minutes. Thank you. He will join soon. Please bear with us for a few seconds. Sir will join soon. Uh, 
our first speaker is joining soon with us we are in constant communication with him so please be with us and thanks for your patience I think sir is here. Um, so our first speaker for the session, Mr. J. V. Vaskar, IFS 2006 batch, Conservator of Forests, WP and GIS, Government of West Bengal. Sir. <coughs> Yeah, good evening. Good evening, good evening, sir. Please. You can hear me? Yes, sir. Okay. So can we start? Yes, sir, sure. Okay. Thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, I have been um, asked to share our views on the career in administrative jobs. Um, first of all, I am grateful to the faculty of the Ashutosh College for giving me this opportunity to share uh, some of the aspects in the administrative jobs that uh, one can explore. Uh, I belong to 2006 batch of Indian Forest Service. So I joined this uh, West Bengal cadre in the year 2008 after finishing my training. So and then I worked in the uh, field of wildlife as a deputy field director in Baksa Tiger Reserve and then uh, worked briefly in uh, Jaldapara National Park as a divisional forest officer. Later on, I worked in uh, Bankara Forest Division and presently, I'm working as conservator of forest and planning on GIS. As uh, we all know, uh, there are a lot of administrative posts uh, in the government. So starting from chief secretary to director general of police, uh, foreign secretary in the ministry of external affairs, commissioners, and uh, in case of railway, there are deputy uh, divisional railway managers, district magistrates, 
superintendent of police and uh, divisional forest officer so on and so forth there are plenty of other posts which are uh, manned by the administrative officers or uh, we call it in in government uh, bureaucrats so you must have come across these uh, many officers in the day to day um, media coverage or maybe through social media or print media and all so just to give an um, outlook of how an administrative service hierarchy uh, works so we all know that uh, block uh, each block is headed by a block development officer and then uh, there is a subdivisional office who is again manned by subdivisional officer above him there will be an additional district magistrate and then in the whole district uh, the district is uh, administered by a district magistrate and above district magistrate there will be commissioners and then the principal secretary is uh, governing each uh, departments or sectors and then there will be additional chief secretary and then chief secretary this is the administrative hierarchy that uh, we can see in the uh, day to day administration similarly in police service also we can see similar kind of hierarchy uh, starting from inspector then sub divisional police officer additional uh, sp and sp inspector general of police and additional dgp and then the whole police force is headed by director general police officer so these are the likewise in all the uh, service a uh, similar kind of hierarchical structure uh, is there so as per the like uh, the constitution of india uh, provides an option for creating all india service in article 312 the union government has been empowered to create all india service so after we got the independence even even before independence all india service uh, was there like uh, imperial civil service we used to call that time and uh, after we got independence the country has to be governed by some kind of uh, uh, strong governance so for that they needed uh, officers at the various levels for that <clears throat> indian parliament passed an indian service all indian service act according to which the all india service was created so all india service is basically comprised of three services uh, indian administrative service indian police service and indian forest service so these three services constitute all india service and then there are central services like indian revenue service indian postal service uh, railway service customs and excise and uh, there are many central service services also so the difference between all india service and central service is all india service is uh, is a cadre based service wherein these officers will be allotted to particular states and they will be basically uh, thereafter will be governed by the individual states where they will work whereas the central services are basically the central government uh, officers and uh, they will man the post in the central government as i said uh, the officers of all india services will be employed in the states as well as the central government so basically they will be allotted to particular cadre states and then uh, they can from there they can be put to any of the uh, governing sector as per the demand of the government whereas the central services the officers will be only employed in the specific jobs like the revenue officer will only look after the uh, uh, income tax or customs officers will look after the customs whereas the audit and account service uh, they, excuse me sir yeah. uh, the ppt is not working i think it is not moving it's not moving we got state no sir now it, it we can see it okay okay is it so. moving now yes sir it's okay. moving now okay then i'll put it in this mode only okay okay so uh, i'll just briefly uh, since you could not see the previous slide the all india service has been created as per the provisions of the indian constitution in the article 312 so union government can create all india services so so far uh, three all india services have been created uh, that is indian administrative service indian police service and indian forest service the rest of the services are called central services so the all india service uh, the difference between all india and central service is that all india service is shared between both center and the state whereas the central services are only uh, employed by the central government officers and there will be again a specific uh, specialized uh, jobs kind like uh, indian revenue service will look after the only the income uh, tax department customs will look after the customs uh, matters so so on and so forth so in fact uh, uh, the 
our first home minister of the country sardar walbai patel uh, said the uh, he called the civil servants as the steel frame of india because after we got independence they needed a strong uh, bureaucratic uh, administrative arrangement to govern the country and also to uh, provide the services and execute the uh, various schemes of the government so he said he called it as a steel frame of india and since then uh, there have been other services have been added to the existing list uh, as as per the demand of the day so how can one get into these services so these services uh, both all india and central services uh, are basically recruited by uh, union public service commission on the basis of common uh, all india service examination so upsc will advertise the uh, exam and the uh, number of posts vacant accordingly applicants can uh, take up this exam and get into the service so i'll just briefly uh, some of the services i'll brief you like indian administrative service this is the uh, premier service that is most sought after by the um, seekers i mean who are, who are willing to join these services and then there is indian foreign service we are all aware of the fact that india has got lot of uh, embassies in the other countries uh, where uh, either indian origin people live or we have got bilateral relations with those countries to take care of the external affairs of the country with the other nations and also to take care of the citizens living in the, in, in, the, in those countries so there is a separate service called indian foreign service and then there is indian police service to look after the law and order of the country and then there is indian revenue service there are two categories in indian revenue service one is customs and indirect uh, taxes customs is like uh, we have got large network of airports um, and um, ports from where in lot of custom goods uh, we either import or export to keep track of the those things there is a separate service and also to look at to look into the indirect taxes like gst and other and, and other things so that is one service and then there is one indian revenue service up within that income tax uh, is a separate uh, uh, sector again and then we have got indian audit and account service this is again under the control and controller and auditor general of india so like cag is a uh, expenditure watchdog for the uh, governments so whatever expenditure government is is doing or uh, is going to do is will be audited by the uh, this accounts uh, uh, service service group and it is headed by the cag and we have got civil account service under the ministry of finance corporate law service where in the ministry of corporate affairs the officers need to look into the corporate companies and other things and then uh, we have got uh, three large armed forces uh, uh, serving the country and defending the country in the form of indian army in the form of navy and uh, air force so all these uh, services have got huge establishments available at various parts of the country uh, these establishments has to be manned by someone so like uh, each army will have a big uh, uh, cantonment or a camp or an air force base so these are basically looked after by the indian defense estate service officer so those officers are posted to look after the, these establishments and also defense has got separate set of uh, expenditure to look to guide them and to help them so they have got a account service also and then we have got large network of posts and for that to indian postal service is there and then ministry of information and broadcasting uh, departments and uh, communication there is an indian information service and um, similarly to guide them uh, there is accounts and finance service also um railways is also a huge uh, network and a big uh, ministry which has got a lot of uh, uh, bureaucrats and administrators so they have got different uh, group a services like indian railway protection force service indian railway personal service indian railway account service so lot of railway related services are also there which are basically under the ministry of railway and uh, they are uh, taking care of the indian railways as such and then there is a uh, indian trade service like uh, we have got import and ex export and there is a uh, director general of trade who looks after these uh, kind of services under the ministry of commerce and industry so they also i think these uh, service people are usually employed to take care of the matters so in order to get into this service what is the eligibility 
so basically to get into indian administrative service foreign service and indian police service which are kind of uh, sensitive and uh, nationally important so uh, one must be a, a citizen of india for all other services he must be a citizen of india or he can be uh, from any of the neighboring countries who came to india before 1962 Uh, and has settled here permanently or even from the uh, some other countries like pakistan burma sri lanka or some of the african countries uh, where people have people of indian origin have migrated and settled here so basically indian citizen and any of the these category people are eligible to apply to these services so what is the age limit for one to get into these services the minimum age prescribed is 21 years and maximum is 32 years again depending on the uh, various category of people like there is an age uh, relaxation for people belonging to scheduled castes and scheduled tribes up to maximum 5 years age relaxation is there and for backward class 3 years uh, age relaxation is there and for uh, those who are having uh, benchmark uh, physical disabilities they they have got an um, um leverage of 10 years uh, so there is a relaxation for these kind of candidates but for general category candidates it's 21 years is the minimum and maximum age is 32 years and it is usually counted on the 1st of august of every year every year of the examination like suppose uh, 2022 if the if this is the year of examination on august 1st 2022 whatever age, age is there that age will be counted for this purpose and then um, the minimum educational qualification is basic uh, graduate degree from any of the legal uh, colleges or universities so that should suffice the educational qualification now uh, what are the number of attempts one can get to um, attempt the attempt to get into these services so maximum attempts permitted is 6 attempts again uh, there is a relaxation for uh, candidates belonging to scheduled castes and scheduled tribes and also other backward classes and uh, the for persons with benchmark disabilities like as i said for age there is 32 years and then for general category six attempts one one can attempt six times for obc the uh, 32 plus 3 years uh, uh, relaxation and they will also get uh, three more attempts nine attempts and for scheduled tribes and scheduled tribes there is no limit on number of attempts as such but there is a age limit of uh, to maximum of 37 years one can attempt uh, one can write these exams so how these attempts are counted if you just appear for any one of the papers then it will be counted as one attempt but if you just apply and if you don't uh, write any 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 one paper or even attempt an exam then it will not be counted as one attempt so six attempts but when we used to write the exams we had only four attempts so after that i think government of india has increased the number of attempts six attempts is fair enough for a candidate to get through these exams uh, there will be uh, three stages of uh, examination um, one has to go through so stage one will be preliminary examination which will be basically uh, multiple choice questions objective type and stage 2 will be main examination it will be written and objective type and stage 3 will be a personality test so one candidate has to go through all these stages once you qualify preliminary then only you can apply uh, appear in mains and once you qualify mains then only you will be called for personality test i hope my slides are visible now i mean it's moving yes sir okay thank you so as i said preliminary examination this is the first stage uh, wherein one candidate has to appear for two papers so one is general studies 1 and general studies 2 each will be of uh, 200 marks each and pre, uh, for general paper 1 uh, the topics usually covered are uh, current events current affairs of national and international importance history of india the indian freedom struggle indian national movement and the Uh, geography history and the uh, geography of the world and uh, constitution of india the uh, political scenario of the country and the uh, after uh, developments of the political uh, scenario and then uh, bit of economics and uh, social sector and poverty and uh, other issues and then there are environmental issues and uh, biodiversity and climate change and then there will be a general kind of science the basic science 
so usually the uh, science and history and other textbooks of uh, from 6th standard to 12th standard uh, books will be good enough to go through and in addition to that one has to uh, look at the everyday happenings and the current affairs what is happening around the world in the in all these sectors so anything under the these subjects can can come in the exam so one has to prepare uh, to their best and the syllabus for general studies is uh, comprehension communication skills uh, reasoning and decision making it is basically kind of aptitude test uh, wherein there will be some kind of uh, uh, mathematical uh, problems uh, some kind of decision making problems uh, reasoning problems etc so the second paper is basically a qualifying paper so one has to secure 33% in the second paper then only his first paper will be considered for screening so second paper one has to qualify to to consider his paper paper one for the screening so again the preliminary examination is only for screening purpose so these marks will not be counted in the final selection process this is only the screening process wherein candidates will be screened to, so as to reduce the number of uh, persons appearing in the mains examination and the uh, paper 2 is qualifying in nature and if you don't qualify in the paper 2 then you it, you you are as good as uh, not considered then uh, once you clear the preliminary examination then uh, you will get a call to appear for the mains examination so mains examination will consist of uh, qualifying examinations wherein uh, you have to appear in two languages one english language and any of the indian languages you can take each uh, paper will consist of 300 marks each and this is again qualifying mark so here uh, out of 300 you have to secure 25% mark that is 75 marks in each paper so you, you have to this is mandatory qualification and the most in most of the candidates can easily get through uh, and then there will be five papers uh, so one paper will be essay writing um, one paper will be on indian heritage culture and uh, history and other such things the other paper will be again polity and uh, governance uh, constitution and the paper four will be on technology uh, biodiversity security and uh, economic economy economics paper five will be of ethics integrity and uh, aptitude and then you will have two optional subjects which you have to choose among the subjects that are available based on the your uh, your interest or maybe in whichever subject you have already studied so there will be totally so many papers to appear in the mains so optional subjects as i said there are two papers of 250 marks each so optional subjects you can choose from any of these uh, optional subjects uh, and in each paper will have uh, two uh, agriculture animal husbandry anthropology botany chemistry a lot of subjects are uh, there for anyone to choose among and uh, you can choose any one of these subjects like engineering commerce economics um, geography and then geology history law almost all uh, sectors of uh, uh, science and other academic backgrounds are covered here and for detail list you can see the upsc website also you can get the details so from engineering to medicine to commerce uh, to uh, science all subjects are more or less covered and also apart from these subjects one can also uh, write the exam in literature of any of the following languages which are recognized by the government like from assamese to mo most of the uh, their mother tongues or maybe so as to say the native languages have been covered here so one can take uh, literature of uh, one of these languages as one of the optionals so that ends the total marks for mains examination will be 1750 marks so comprising all these uh, except for the qualifying papers that is languages so uh, five papers plus two optional papers so 750 marks will be the total marks so once you clear the uh, main examination then you will be called for personality test which will be it will be for uh, 275 marks uh, this uh, upsc will call for the personality test and it will be conducted by various committees uh, so usually the committees uh, comprises of uh, experts from the various fields and uh, it's quite secret um, they usually you don't know to which committee you will be going until the last uh, probably uh, minute so it's quite a fair assessment of the uh, individual's personality
and then the final merit list is compiled based on the uh, total marks that you get from the written examination that is uh, 1750 marks how much you get and then the personality test is added to that so total marks out of uh, 20 uh, 2025 marks whatever marks you get based on that the ranking will be decided so the syllabus for optional papers you can uh, log into upsc website and uh, go through the syllabus of each paper so this is with regard to the indian um, um, civil services and the, uh, there is a separate exam for indian forest service uh, which is slightly different from the uh, uh, civil service examination i'll just uh, briefly uh, take you to the indian forest service examination uh, again here eligibility conditions age limit and number of attempts are all almost same as for the civil service examination and uh, however there is a slight difference here only the science background uh, students can only write for the indian forest service examination since they will be asked to uh, manage the natural resources of the country uh, they have to they, they need some kind of scientific uh, background so that is the criteria and uh, based on that the uh, candidates who are having uh, degrees in the following subjects can opt for indian forest service examination like uh, veterinary science uh, botanical background chemistry background geology mathematics physics and statistics and agriculture forestry and engineering zoology etc so the preliminary examination will be same for all the exams it will be same for civil service and same for indian forest service also the main examination will be a different one for the indian forest service and then personality test also will be a different so once you qualify the personality test then again you have to uh, complete there is a physical test also uh, like each candidate has to complete uh, probably uh, 25 kilometers of walking uh, in 4 hours to test the endurance of the uh, candidate so once you complete all these then only will be finally selected for the service so the uh, maximum marks for mains examination uh, in case of forest service is 1400 so there we saw it was 1750 but here it is 1400 um the papers that are available for uh, forest service are general english general knowledge and then uh, you have to choose two optional uh, subjects uh, in each optional subject there will be two papers paper 1 and paper 2 so four papers in optional subject one has to right so total marks will be for 1400 so these are the optional subjects uh, which are basically of uh, science background so agriculture agriculture engineering veterinary sciences botany chemistry chemical engineering civil engineering and forestry geology mathematics all all science background subjects are available as optional subjects uh, but again there is a um, clause here uh, condition here that uh, one cannot choose the uh, uh, two optional subjects which are uh, closely related uh, so that candidates will have a slightly slightly advantage of uh, not having to study much so that's why these combinations are not allowed again so like agriculture and agriculture engineering is not allowed agriculture animal husband is not allowed agriculture and forestry is not allowed uh, maths and statistics is not allowed so accordingly we have to choose two different uh, subjects uh, one is whatever is our background another one is probably you know, which are we are comfortable um, in studying that subjects we can choose so we have to keep in mind that we are not choosing the similar kind of subjects so once you uh, pass uh, you, you you pass the mains examination then you will be called for a personality test and that personality test is for 300 marks so the total marks in the final merit list is 700 1700 marks uh, so so once you get selected uh, based on the final results uh, then you will be uh, given an appointment um, by the president of india in all the services even for the central services indian forest services the appointment is basically given by the president of india so you are appointed on behalf of the uh, uh, government of india but it is given in the name of president so what would one expect as a pay scale if you once get selected into these services 
so like right now the seventh pay commission is running and based on the seventh pay commission the initial at the entry level entry level uh, the pay will be like uh, 56000 some it is the basic pay basic plus you will get uh, da and other allowances and um, as you move up the ladder your uh, pay keeps on increasing so the final apex scale in the in terms of the state like what a chief secretary will, will get is 225000 uh, that is fixed plus da and other allowances Uh, whereas in case of uh, cabinet secretary in government of india that is the highest scale 250000 uh, that is per month plus uh, da and other allowances so this is the scale one can expect so there is a fixed uh, um, scale uh, from based on the pay commissions and uh, one would expect uh, various levels of the pay uh, to get into those pays uh, as and when they get promoted from time to time And similarly in even in police also the same kind of uh, hierarchy is there and uh, like uh, once and as an uh, initial recruit one would be one would be posted as assistant commissioner of police or uh, dosp so and then one can get into top rank like uh, director general of police so that will be the apex scale and this is the beginner scale so this is how the pay scale is is more or less common across all the services Uh, except minor uh, changes uh, maybe indian administrative service in between may have got few increments more but once you reach the top it's all same for all the services and what are the promotional uh, prospects so one one good thing about the uh, all india service and central services is that so you get a time bound promotion Uh, until unless uh, you are stuck up in some uh, vigilance cases or some complaints or some corruption issues so if you have got a good uh, service record the promotion is almost uh, uh, time bound except at the top level like uh, maybe at the chief secretary level uh, it's depending on the vacancy so other than that you will get uh, time bound promotion so the first year uh, in in the beginning four years you will get one promotion then uh, nine years 13 years 16 years and 25 years of service so you get promotion accordingly the scale of pay also will keep on increasing so it's a quite a promising uh, promotional uh, prospect since it is time bound and uh, uh, if you are if you are uh, delivering uh, proper uh, service to the country or state so you will be promoted uh, as per the time schedule Uh, once the candidates are selected based on the uh, final interview personality test so they will be given a, an appointment so on the basis of appointment they will be uh, first sent to training schools so initially there will be a, a foundation course training yes so foundation course training is common for all the services either it is uh, uh, done by the uh, lal bahadur shastri national academy of administration at masuri in uttarakhand so which also trains the ias officers or uh, if the candidates are more they may distribute to other uh, institutes also the foundation course will be for 3 uh, months wherein you will be exposed to uh, uh, various governance issues you will be exposed to uh, various parts of the country uh, rural areas you will be sent to uh, villages to study the village um, conditions and schemes and other things you will be given all kinds of exposure there will be uh, arms physical all kinds of exposure is given there will be a parliamentary attachment to see how the parliament works so those kind of uh, introductory training will be given and once that is completed then you will be sent to respective training institutes like uh, the indian police officers will go to hyderabad uh, where there is a national police academy sardar vallabhai patel national police academy Uh, the ias officers are trained in masuri only in the same institute and the uh, civil uh, uh, indian forest service officers are trained at indira gandhi national forest academy at dehradun similarly the irs officers have got their institute at nagpur and uh, customs has got at faridabad auditor nakoons is at shimla so at various uh, services have got their own training institutes where they will undergo trainings varying from 9 months to uh, one or two years also 
so uh, during the training there will be also exposure to a, a whole country like there will be a bharat darshan kind of thing where you will be uh, uh, sent to all parts of the country to get yourself uh, acquainted with the culture the region and uh, um, the nation the diversity of the nation and the various arms of the government that are working you will be uh, exposed to all such things and once you uh, get inducted into the uh, uh, service uh, like uh, all india service officers will be sent to their respective cadres like in my case my my cadre is west bengal so i have to come and work in the state of west bengal similarly the people who have been allotted to karnataka tamil nadu or uttar pradesh wherever so they will go to their respective cadres and then start uh, working at the uh, basic level the initial will be like uh, for an as officer will be like uh, sdo and for a police officer will be like uh, dosp and uh, or sdpo and for a forest officer it will be like acf so from there one will start their career so once once they finish four years and then they'll get their first promotion and then they will move the ranks like uh, adms or additional sps or Uh, then they become sp and dms so once you get into the service again uh, the academies and the government will send you for mid mid career uh, trainings to just to update you on the latest uh, technology latest developments um, and such other issues even uh, there will be a, a recently they have introduced the component of foreign training also where in the you know, each institute will take take you to uh, an abroad country uh, to study their model of uh, governance like in uh, in, this, in the in the case of indian administrative service uh, they they were having uh, to to south korea to study the model of governance and health and other issues uh, like uh, police uh, services were taken to scotland or maybe australia and some some other places uh, forest service were taken to sweden and uh, united states of america to study the their models of natural resource management and so similarly all kinds of services uh, will be exposed to various kinds of uh, training and uh, external exposure is given to them so and there is also a uh, concept of uh, deputation wherein uh, like all india service officers can also go to other departments on the central deputation like one one who is working in a particular state can opt for a central deputation once he finishes maybe 7 years of initial service so he can also get to work in the central government uh, in any of the departments so the government announces the vacancies based on that so any officer can give, go and work in ministry of uh, uh, finance or ministry of defense so if they want to work on those uh, places even in between the states also one can move like suppose if somebody has uh, their home cadre is kerala and if is get allotted to orissa if he wants to go back to work on kerala uh, so there is a a time period of 5 years is allowed so that you can go and work in in your home state provided both the states agree to that so as uh, police officers uh, they can get a lot of opportunity to work in uh, various uh, capacities and various organizations uh, like uh, cbi uh, and uh, enforcement directorate uh, ncb uh, then bsf itbp all these uh, paramilitary forces are also headed by ips officers so you get wide variety of op- options to uh, go and work in any of these uh, agencies as i said uh, there will be a plenty of exposure to wide variety of aspects uh, of the governance international training exposure to all kinds of uh, <clears throat> rural uh, living urban living and governance issues industry economics so very very kind of exposure is given to uh, the officers so there is a plenty of uh, learning here and as the as we go up the ladder the, the personality of the officer also uh, improves because of these exposures uh, just the sheer opportunity to work for the uh, uh, people of the country and uh, to deliver on the uh, deliverables in various schemes so it's it's a very very challenging uh, uh, career for anyone and uh, one should one should always try to this this is the highest uh, like um, entry point to any government service so so this is the highest uh, so where one can get into the service at the highest level 
so it's quite motivating to get into that level and once you get into this level it's easy to move up the ladder and uh, to become the head of the department or head of the ministry so uh, when you handle at that level you get plenty of opportunities plenty of interactions and plenty of learnings and then how do one sustain uh, the career once they get selected so uh, like each career there will be an annual assessment so, so the officer will be assessed for his performances uh, on an annual basis so based on that uh, one has to perform and uh, based on performance is uh, assessment is done and uh, based on the assessment whatever uh, remarks that he is getting his promotions will be considered so one has to be either very good or outstanding to uh, uh, get the promotions timely so most of the officers do do get 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 these kind of assessments and then uh, there is also a scope for specialization like some people uh, do want to be good in economics they want to uh, banking sector and finances and then they, they get an opportunity to work in international uh, organizations like uh, united nations or maybe indian uh, imf uh, adb banks and all similarly we got lot of op options to uh, specialize in the fields of uh, like uh, uh, gis and public policy and a uh, lot of options are available so one, one has to uh, keep on upgrading his skills even after getting into the service so one has to keep on upgrading the skills that's why i think the government has kept the mid career uh, upgradation for all the officers and that is made compulsory also so one has to attend those trainings to upgrade themselves on the latest technology latest happenings around the world and latest uh, acts and rules that one has to implement so all these aspects are there so i would suggest uh, um, all the willing candidates to give it a try i mean uh, this is the best opportunity that the country gives you uh, to get into the premier services and uh, not only the challenges and you also enjoy a lot of powers and uh, perks also so the district level officers either a superintendent of police or district magistrate um, they enjoy lot of uh, powers uh, and responsibilities and uh, they are quite challenging so one get to organize uh, elections one get to organize big events uh, the visits of uh, foreign ministers and foreign amb ambassadors so one and you you talk to them and you interact with them and uh, that's a, a huge opportunity uh, like recently we saw uh, in ukraine uh, the, the war war of ukraine people had to be evacuated so indian foreign uh, service officers so were the ones who who, who manage these things so it's quite satisfying uh, for anyone to do these kind of uh, challenging jobs so i think uh, i'll i just shared you briefly uh, the opportunities then how to what are the services that are available for one to um, explore and what is the procedure of recruitment so this is just a basic outline and uh, the examination no doubt is uh, is premier examination and it's quite challenging and one needs to uh, prepare uh, quite hard uh, and at the same time um, if you put in one or two years of hard work and uh, it's easy to get in so Uh, that's all from my side and uh, if you got any uh, further queries i would be happy to uh, share my thoughts on thank you thank you thank you so much sir first of all i would like to thank you for bringing out time from this hectic and busy schedule and we are really thankful for your worthwhile deliberation and i hope that students get immense help from how you have categorically explained through your powerpoint presentation how to choose the right administrative path thank you again sir for informative and insightful lecture and many questions are pouring in so i would like to pass on for the question answer session to dr priyanka roy and dr devabrata chandra sir Ma'am and sir, the platform is yours for moderation of question and cessation of sir. Thank you, Devastuti, ma'am. Am I audible? Yes, yes, please. Yes. Uh, 
Uh, okay, sir. So, so here we have many questions for you, but like we have uh, due to scarcity of time, we have selected uh, two questions. Uh, the first one is that uh, regarding interaction of like adjoining tribals with the forest ecosystem, what are the steps taken by the government to educate them regarding conservation of the forest? Um, see, uh, the government of India mandates uh, the management of forest resources uh, based on the joint forest management committees so what we are supposed to have uh, all the fringe of the villages that are adjoining to the forest we are supposed to first form joint forest management committees so in most of the uh, country now joint forest management committees are there so where every tribal and every villager is part of that committee and um, what happens is we in, we interact uh, with them on a regular basis and they are now part of the governance forest governance so even the whatever revenue earnings that government gets from the these forests is shared with them like uh, in in case of west bengal we share 40% of like if we earn 100 rupees from the forest of that particular committee the 40 rupees is given back to them for their uh, welfare uh, so now the uh, 1988 policy indian forest policy also envisages that the management of forest through joint forest management committees. We have got huge network of uh, committees now. So they're all part of our forest family. Now. Yeah, and uh, most of the, uh, their uh, awareness and their uh, they get involved into the day-to-day -day management of uh, forest now. So most of them are quite aware of the, their rights and uh, uh, responsibilities. Yeah. Uh, so we have another question. Uh, sir, in case of any difficult situation or kind of any challenging situation, how uh, one should uh, like you know keep uh, one school actually to to face those kind of difficulties? It is very common in in ser services, sir. If you can share your experience yeah. with us. Yeah. So so we are uh, the bureaucrats are basically administrators are governed by the rules and procedures. So obviously there will be a lot of pressures uh, from either public uh, or from the political uh, wings. There will be obviously pressures, but uh, we, we have to go by the constitution. So constitution has given the mandate, uh, what are the principles of uh, like uh, governance and uh, we, we go by that rules. Sometimes uh, you have to withstand that pressure. You may get uh, transferred to other places or you may, you may get, even government may ignore you for some time. But that's the challenge. One has to one has to accept that challenge, and you, you have to stick to the principles and ideologies that the country has given to the officer. So it is. I'm I'm sure uh, most of the officers uh, do stand up to the challenges. There will be like uh, some people who, who do succumb, but in the long run, again they 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 suffer. So in the long run, only those who can uh, withstand the challenges, they only succeed. So in the short run, maybe people who can succumb to the challenges uh, may have a, a good day but in the long run they, they will suffer but uh, it is uh, definitely a good question there are a lot of uh, that kind of challenges will be there and as a uh, officer and his family will be should be ready to sacrifice maybe for a short period of time to face those challenges okay sir sir one last question like uh, is kind of uh, we would like to hear uh, like from you about any exciting situation or like uh, challenging situation which you have faced like you know uh, in your service life sir please share with us we would like to hear uh, challenging uh, situation Yeah, I would like to share like uh, they, uh, when I was uh, working as uh, a divisional forest officer in uh, Jaldapara. So Jaldapara, as you all know, is uh, famous for uh, one-horned rhinoceros. So this one-horned rhinoceros, uh, the rhino has got a horn. And uh, for some strange reason, this horn is in huge demand in the countries like China and Southeast Asian countries. So usually in, in our country, Kaziranga is the uh, big national park which has got a lot of rhinos. After Kaziranga is uh, is the Jaldapara. So we have got around, uh, now around 300 rhinos or so. So these rhinos are poached to, to get those rhino horns. So when I was working there, uh, there was one gang which came from the uh, Manipur uh, and they had poached uh, uh, one or two rhinos and uh, we were not able to crack those gangs for quite some time. 
and uh, what we did is uh, we took the help of police and other uh, investigative agencies we uh, we actually got the mobile number of uh, those persons so uh, from that mobile number we tracked their uh, position where they were and we were able to track them to manipur and then um, we we kind of uh, put a bait to them to come back to the state west bengal and they they came here and then in the night we raided them we arrested them and uh, we recovered the weapons from them and then uh, we had sent them to jail and uh, and then we prosecuted them i mean they will be uh, in the court al- almost the case went on up to 6 months and um, <clears throat> we were able to prosecute them successfully and uh, court awarded them uh, almost 3 years of uh, rigorous imprisonment so that was uh, quite an um, successful i mean Uh, in in the uh, we we also sent teams from here to Manipur. Uh, Manipur is is almost in Myanmar border, so we were able to track down the gang and the, how the horn was routed and to other countries how much money they got, and uh, we got a lot of cooperation from police and investigative agencies also. So it's it's kind of collective teamwork. So one one agency cannot do, but uh, it's kind of teamwork. So after that, I mean. Um, one we got that uh, coaches successfully convicted so after that i think uh, even the uh, lawyers got lot of interest in supporting the environmental cause and they were like fourth coming and they fought our cases and after that we were like able to put lot of people uh, behind the bars uh, especially these kind of uh, coaches so that is one uh, uh, in fact we we got an um, uh, chief minister's award for that uh, also thank you sir sir this was a very great story and very uh, inspiring one thank you so much uh, now over to the anchors thank you thank you priyanka ma'am and devabrata chandra sir for helping us in moderating the question answer session thank you vashka sir once again and we are looking forward to have you again and guide our students in the right administrative path thank you sir thank you uh, thank you very much and uh, i wish uh, some of you uh, do join these services and uh, will be i'll be glad to work with you all guys and uh, wishing you all the best uh, for your uh, studies as well as your future careers and uh, thank i my sincere thanks to the college and uh, principal and vice chancellor uh, for giving me this opportunity to share my thoughts with you and uh, thank you for the patient hearing and sparing your time uh, thank you very much all the best thank you so much sir now i am proceeding to the second speaker our second speaker is mr shujay banerjee sir and let me read his brief introduction in front of you and i am privileged to read his introduction Mr Shujay Banerjee is a HR professional with 31 years of experience across industry sectors like automobile tire chemicals gases consumer good industrial products IT pharmaceuticals FMCG infrastructure and construction he is currently the group chief people officer and group head marketing at Kenwell Common Cells Private Limited formerly tractors in their private limited he is a post graduate in personal management from xavier institute of social science social service batch 198890 and recipient of nipm silver medal he is also a certified executive coach from coaching foundation india during the course of his professional journey he had hands on experience in industrial relations in a multiple union environment and entire bandwidth of hr processes and has played a major role in organizing transformation and managing change in his various assignments he has been awarded with many prestigious awards amongst which uh, i would like to mention some of them he has been awarded hr leadership award in the asia pacific hrm congress 2012 in september 2012 
He has been awarded HR Professional of the Year Award in the India Human Capital Awards, December 2012. And he has been awarded with HR Leadership Award by Institute of Public Enterprises in Global HR Excellence Award at World HRD Congress in February 2013 and many more. Sir, we are very grateful and pleased to have you on board today. And to moderate Shujai Banerjee sir's session, I would also like to invite Sneha ma'am from BBA, faculty of BBA, Sneha to moderate the session. Welcome you both in the platform. Thank you so much, uh, Debastuti ma'am. Am I audible clearly? Yes, yes, you are audible. All right, thank you so much. Uh, Shujar, sir, with your permission, may we proceed with the session? Sure, sure. Oh, thank you so much. So, am I in the right profession? Have I taken up management sciences as a very wise decision in my life? How would I be able to crack an interview with the best of the brands that's there? How do I know which is my industry? How would I upskill myself? And even if I do know which is my preferred industry, how would I know that the organization culture of my company is toxic or it has traces of incivility in that? And the list of such questions goes on. Every management student, at least once during their academic career pauses and ponders over questions like this. And why just management student? Technically, anyone who aims to have a decent career hovers over these kind of questions in their mind. And these questions ideally do not find much place in the best-selling textbooks that we study, be it that of Philip Kotler, K. Ashwathapa, Harold Kunz, but is only understood and learned only when we get a real-time exposure onto it. So if you are a student who has similar kind of questions in your mind, just like we all had when we were studying management, congratulations, this session is specially curated for you. A very good evening to one and all present here. A warm welcome to our esteemed resource person today, Mr. Shujai Banerjee, sir. We are extremely privileged to have been given an opportunity to deal with a persona like you one-on-one -on, -one on this virtual platform. Without wasting any further time, I would like to request, sir, to kindly begin with the session. Over to you, sir. Uh, thank you, Sneha. Thank you, <clears throat> Devastuti. And uh, a very good evening to all my young friends on the other side of the digital platform. Uh, it's, it's actually very challenging for me because I did my management school education about 30 years back, in fact, 32 years back. And uh, to talk to young kids, or I would, sorry for uh, uh, telling you guys kids, because as far as my age is concerned, relative term, you guys are kids. Uh, because my, I have a son who's also 28 years old, he's doing his PhD in Cornell. So I, if he's a kid to me, people on the other side of this, a digital platform or doing the BBA programs are also kids by my standards of age. So uh, I went to a college called Jadavpur University uh, where uh, Dr. Shengupta Chandramani Shengupta happens to be a very good friend of mine. We studied together. Uh, so I remember my college days when uh, we were in college and trust you, me, we were equally confused as you guys are today. So times haven't changed 32 years down the line. So uh, College life is usually a lot of fun. College life is full of, uh, what should I say, uh, getting out of school, out of the discipline of the school and getting into a free environment where you have the liberty of attending or not attending a class. So how do you manage this? How do you manage this freedom? How do you manage uh, the freedom as well as the requirement to shape up your career, shape up your life. So we are actually in a bit of a dilemma. And the first year typically goes in enjoying the freedom. 
by which time reality dawns on all of us that we've just got two more years to go through our graduation process and uh, give our lives a shape and a meaning. And that's exactly where the dilemma, the challenges, the conflict comes in our mind. What do we do next? Do we go ahead into our lives just with a graduation certificate as, a, a, as the only degree or the only uh, qualification? Or do I need to upskill myself and go in for a management program? So we get into this sort of uh, 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 thought process. And a lot of us I've seen over the last couple of years, I work with a lot of uh, young talents and young minds like you. They get into preparing for the CAT or the Z, uh, XMAT or the ZAT or whatever it is across or the management entrance examinations across the country. And they get into preparing from the end of second year. They give the exams in December, January, November. And then they typically look forward to results which come out in February. And then they start preparing for the GDPIs and then look at, in, uh, look at uh, cracking a process and getting into a management school. So is that the only option available to young talents like you? Certainly not. Management has become some sort of a rat race. It's become a machine which churns out managers every year in dozens, in thousands across the country. And I also happen to be one who's passed 32 years back. But then, to be honest, in those days, when I passed out of college, when Jadavpur, when I was in Jadavpur doing my political science, I had very few options because uh, being a humanities student, I didn't have uh, the option of becoming a chartered accountant. I didn't have the option of becoming a medical pr practitioner, nor an engineer. So what, what next? So perforce, I had to look at a professional qualification. I was not cut out to be in academics like a lot of professors out here are because I was not that good in studies. I was average. Uh, I was interested in a lot of else in things in life like dramatics, sports. So uh, academics featured a bit lower down in my priority list. But then I realized that high time I gave my career some sort of a meaning. And therefore, I went to a management school. But today, when I talk to young talents or young minds like you, when I go to campuses, uh, even recruit graduates from colleges, or even talk to my son uh, when he was doing his college and presidency college uh, till uh, from 2013 to 2016, I could make out that people are looking at a lot of alternate professions in life. People are looking at becoming a DJ. People are looking at becoming a tattoo artist. People are looking at becoming a professional a mountaineer, helping people to do trekking. People are looking at becoming DJs, RJs. So now every all these professions are now becoming alternate professions. It is no more the standard uh, stereotype professions of becoming a doctor or a lawyer or a engineer or medical practitioner, which is all, which is only being opted by the young talents. And I personally feel, I'm of the opinion that a young talent or a young mind who's sitting on the other side of the digital platform has a liberty and a right to pursue his or her passion provided, provided you are good at it, you're convinced that you will be good at it, and you really want to pursue that. Don't do it just for the heck of following the footsteps of someone else who's done it. Just because, because in families, we typically figure out that we are under huge pressure. All of us have gone through it, and even you guys are going through it, because when you're doing a BBA program or doing a graduation program, we are usually confronted with a lot of comparisons among siblings, amongst relatives, where our parents tell us that so-and-so's son is doing so-and-so, or so-and-so's daughter is doing so-and-so, whereas what are you doing? You're doing only a graduation. So we are always under this sort of a hammer of our parents. Me being a parent, I'm owning it up. We hammer our children that you have to be this, you have to be that, because so-and-so has, so-and-so's children is so-and-so has done this. Therefore, you guys are under a lot of pressure. One is an expectation from oneself to excel and do something in life, to prove a point 
not only to yourself, to the world around you, and also to your parents, to the eco social ecosystem which surrounds you. So I can very well imagine the stress and pressure, emotional pressure that you guys go through. But then it's very important to understand that corporate life has many dimensions to it. I belong to a school which is three decades old. Therefore, but now when I start talking to young talent, I figure out that they are not looking at an organization to spend their life into it. We get a lot of young talents who come and join us and say that, Mr. Banerjee, are you following corporate governance? Are you following corporate social responsibility? Is your organization giving back something to the society from where, which it, from where it's making its profits and existing? So I find that the young mind today is much more conscious, is much more aware, is much more holistic in his or her approach to life. And therefore, I personally feel that whatever you want to do out after passing out of this college, since you're doing a BBA, I assume, I assume that most of you all will uh, would like to do an MBA, but if you want to still put the job market or try out your hands in a corporate environment in a BBA, be it in finance, be it in marketing, be it in HR, in whichever domain you would like to work, First, be aware of what the domain offers you in terms of job realities and career opportunities. That's very, very important. A lot of us think that we'll get into marketing. I'll just give you an example. We always think we'll get into marketing. What is marketing all about? Most of us are not sure because I go to a lot of business schools, the premier business schools in this country, and there are bright young minds who say that, I don't want to do sales. I want to be in marketing. I want to do product management. I want to do product strategy. I want to do branding, advertising. But then, without knowing what the realities of sales are, how the consumer behaves, you just cannot do marketing. Because you cannot sit, be sitting back at the corporate office and making uh, strategies about a product without knowing how the consumer will behave at the market. Because the consumer has its own behavior patterns, has its own preferences, has its own likings, has its own purchasing power. So you've got to design a product strategy dependent on how the market gives you feedback. And the market feedback can only be learned if you have had a grind of selling a product. And therefore, a lot of these good FMCG companies, be it a Hindustan Unilever, or a Procter & Gamble, or a Smith Klein Beecham, all these companies, even a company where I worked for quite a few years, ever ready, we first always put our management graduates into sales. Go and sell a product in a marketplace. Go and sell a product and figure out how a distributor or a dealer operates. It's very, very important. Because at the end of the day, he is the person who's going to sell you a product. He is the person who gives the company the feedback. You should know what actually are the dynamics of the marketplace. So therefore, that's just an example, illustrative example that I gave you. If you want to be in finance, it's very important that you are good in your basic accounting practices. But an ordinary BCom qualification or a BBA finance is very unlikely to give you a head start or a career uh, which is on a fast track in the domain of finance, because then you'll be competing with a chartered accountant or a cost accountant and MBA finance. And you will not be allowed, even an MBA finance or a cost accountant is not allowed to sign a balance sheet. So typically you'll be compete if you're looking into hardcore finance. If you want to get into financial consulting or financial product selling, insurance companies are good. You can always look at insurance companies. But then friends, insurance companies is actually a services and product selling. Because Insurance is an experience, a service, which you need to convince your customer to buy, to provide a security for the future. He is not investing something or she is not investing something for return tomorrow. So a lot of people, a lot of insurance companies come, they recruit people and, all, and they offer good salaries, good incentives. And many a times, young minds get carried away by the money, the lure of the money. 
because you are getting your first time and be earning your salaries. Therefore, you get carried away. You join an insurance company. It's a very high pressure job. Insurance, telecom are very, very high pressure jobs, even FMCG selling. So you have to be used to hard work, no working hours. Therefore, maybe your weekends will go. You won't be able to go for a movie to a quest mall or a South City mall or hang around with your friends. You might have sacrificed a large part of your social commitments. You should be ready for it. Not necessarily work in a metro city like Calcutta. They might give you a Rampur heart, not known for the right, right things nowadays, but then still, uh, just as a illustrative example, maybe a Bakura or a Birbhum or a Shiliguri, anywhere, remote. It's not, it's not city life. So you have to be ready to acclimatize yourself because if you're just preparing to go for after, soon after your graduation into professional life, you have to be ready for the turmoil and the grind because there you will have to prove yourself for two to three years before you move up the organizational hierarchy based on your performance and your potential. Whereas on the other side, if you want to do an MBA soon after your BBA, that's another track you're going to consciously take over. So that you need to, because none of your BBA, whatever you learn, Will be, it will be a reputation in the MBA, I can tell you that. Because you'll be going through the same uh, seven P's of marketing. If you're doing a marketing program, you'll be going same, going to the same HR of, of uh, Maslowian theory, Maslow's need hierarchy theory. If you're doing OB or organizational behavior or HR, you'll have the same concepts repeated. So BBA does not, BBA prepares you, gives you that understanding and orientation for an MBA program. Because in an MBA program, you'll have people also from other disciplines coming in. So you may have an initial head start in terms of understanding or relating to a concept being taught in the class. But after a certain point of time, it's a level playing field vis-a-vis -vis your other batch meets. So if you have to prepare for an MBA program, my submission or advice to each one of you all is by the end of year two or middle of year two, you should start preparing for your cat. You have to. Because the world is competitive, let's not deny it, let's not run away from it. If you want to take that track. And you want to go to a good management school, a decent management school, which offers you a good career and a good life going ahead. Now, these are the standard beaten tracks that people have always gone for. After your graduation, you may feel that, no, grad, I don't want to have the standard life, standard uh, career option. I want to do maybe uh, event management. I want to do travel management. I want to do, I want to be in the hospitality sector. Yes, there are opportunities because these careers are now well-paying, they're well-respected, and now they have positioned themselves as career options in the mind space of not only youngsters, but also uh, people with gray hairs like us who are now allowing our kids also to pursue such professions. I think I'll pause here for a few minutes because I think I've spoken enough. Let it be an interactive session. Uh, I would uh, again request Neha if there are questions. I have got a few questions which are sent out to me. But then uh, rather than I can read out those questions and answer them. But then if anybody or Sneha wishes to further ask me on anything, I would like to take it that way. Sure, sir. We are having five final year students of BBA with us. So, uh, can we uh, pose their questions to you one by one? Sure, sir. My pleasure. Okay. So, students, uh, who would be the first person? I'm sure you're very excited. Uh, I have a privilege to ask the first question. Of course, Naveen. Please go ahead. Uh -huh. Good evening, sir. My name is Naveen Chetri from BBA department, Ashutosh College. And uh, my question to you is, uh, what should be an ideal uh, approach for a fresher for finding their first job? Should they take whatever that comes in their way or be like choosy? They can be selective. Naveen, it's a catch-22, to be honest. I'll be honest. If I would have been in a position, I would have had the, face, the same dilemma, as I said. But uh, I would say... Uh, be choosy with a word of caution because you, you might uh, be having campus placement processes and you might be wanting a, a job in a, say, an FMCG company, just for an example. 
But the first company which comes to your campus is maybe a retail banking company, which wants you to sell uh, credit cards or wants you to sell uh, accounts or whatever client servicing. They give them very fancy, give you very fancy designations. So don't get carried away by them. So and don't get carried away by the salary. You know, I know it's a very important requirement in all our lives because uh, we all of our commitments are commitments towards our family, to ourselves. But then, yes, uh, do a uh, what should I say? Do a trade-off. To be honest, first figure out, answer to yourself, uh, Naveen, what is that you're looking at uh, in terms of? Do you want to? What are you specializing at? If, if I may ask you, sir, HR, HR, wonderful. So, uh, there are two tracks for you. Ed. One is to join an organization as a management trainee HR. And grind your way, but then you will need to couple it up with a professional qualification HR. I'll be very honest with you because being an HR professional myself, my advice to you as an HR person, I'm moving away from the uh, generic question which you asked me. I'll come back to it. But coming to your specific area of specialization or liking HR, uh, getting an HR job from the campus for a BBA student is tough unless a company typically wants to come and says I'm going to recruit HR people and I'm going to invest in them to go through a training program. Are you getting my point? So uh, my submission to you will be for to you will be please try after your BBA program please try to get into a, a good business school for a two-year full-time HR program not the three-year evening program. Three-year evening program is for working professionals. Don't get carried away by that. Or because options of companies coming to a BBA college for HR recruitments will be far and few. Limited scope. If they come, you're going to crack it. And there, my submission to you, submission to you will be please have your domain knowledge solid. Because when we come to a campus, Naveen, we don't expect experience from you guys because you haven't worked in a corporate. So if I would have come to your campus, I would have typically asked you, what have you studied? And if you have studied X, Y, Z, I'm typically going to ask you in your domain specialization. So you should be very confident before preparing for a, a campus interview. And especially being in HR, it's a relatively narrow or specialized field. And in HR, there can be organizational behavior, there can be training and development, there can be industrial relations. There are quite a few dimensions to it. Okay. So uh, my advice to you would be, if you're pursuing HR and if you don't have a company coming to your campus for HR and if you're in, a, if you're in need of a job, because that's also a driving factor which affects our decision making process, take up a job which, is, which will enable you to prepare for your MBA entrance examination. Because if you're an HR person and if HR company doesn't come, they don't come in for HR recruitment. And if you join a marketing company or any other company with a generalist, they'll make you slog because they'll give you targets to meet, right? If you're a generalist. Now, you should have time to prepare for your exams because these entrance examinations, be it SAT, be it MAT, all of these, okay, there are millions of students competing for it. And a percentile here and there can make a difference from one college to another college. So my, to you, my submission would be being an HR student. Uh, think about you if you want to make a career in HR, I would say invest in MBA program, your time, energy and money. If you need to work now and maybe work for two years, save some money and then go to a program, please do that. But Join an organization where you at least can, uh, what should I say, get some time to invest in your preparation. And coming to your general question, again, I would say, uh, be guarded in your selection of your company. Don't just jump into a company just by the brand name and the salary. At times, even smaller companies good give you good quality of assignment. You can learn from it. So just don't I don't want to name any company. Maybe there are a lot of these retail banking companies who come and give you fancy salaries. And then what they make you do is 
like an errand boy. I'm sure, but you wear a tie. That's for sure. You wear a tie and you get a good salary at the end of the month. End of the month, so you can go to a pub or a disc in the beginning of the month. By middle of the month, you've blown it away, and you again ask your parents for the money. That's a separate issue altogether. But then, don't get carried away by the fancy designation or the fancy campus PPTs they make. Ask them what is the job role. What is that you offer to me in terms of a learning experience? That's very very important. Ask these right questions. You have a right to know from an organization what is the learning opportunity, what is the career growth opportunity they are giving you. Salary they will tell you in your in their presentation. But ask them that if I perform, what next? How do I grow in your organization? What is your career development policy? How do you encourage learning and development in your organization? These will give you actually the triggers to evaluate a company. So be a, be a bit choosy. Don't jump into any company which comes on day one just because they have come. Because in a campus interview process, Nabeen, I have gone through it. We are all in the rat race. We feel that if I don't get this job, my friend gets this job, I'll be left alone. Then I'll be compare. We compare ourselves amongst our friends. It's our ki hobby. And that happens. That's psych that's human psychology. You'll feel that affects you. Don't get affected because you should have a very clear state of mind that I'm going to only go for FMCG. I'm only going to go into for banking. I'm only going to go in for telecom. Identify the industry, not the company. Because you have no uh, control over which company is going to come. If it's telecom, you cannot say, I'm only going to work for Vodafone, I'm only going to work for Via, uh, for uh, Bharti Airtel or Geo. You don't know who's going to come to your campus. You should choose your segment of the industry sector. But then be very clear why you're choosing that and what do you want to do in that industry segment. Have I been able to answer your question partially? I confuse you totally. Yeah, sir, you are almost, you just convinced almost me. There. So, so what is the answer? Yes, sir. Pardon me, sir? Uh, Sneha, can we go for the second question, please? Yes, ma'am, sure. Thank you, sir, for explaining it so uh, lucidly and giving examples of what they should seek out. Uh, who do we have next from the uh, student uh, list? Ma'am, I'm next. Okay. okay. Ashutosh, please go ahead with the question. Good evening, everyone. Good evening, sir. This is Ashutosh Roy from Ashutosh College. Wonderful, Ashutosh. Yes, that is my opening line from the department of BBA. Sir, you were explaining just now on how should a fresher select their first job. I'd like to ask you that after one has joined an organization, how can they make sure? that they leave a positive impression on their peers, colleagues, and seniors, uh, especially in the initial months of the job. Great, wonderful. So you're talking about impression management. OK. Uh, yes. When, when, we typically, when we typically recruit, uh, we are very excited. Uh, excited. Ashutosh, please mute yourself. Yeah, can you hear me clearly? Okay, fine. Uh, when we first join an organization, especially our first job, we are in an excited state of mind. We are all uh, gung ho to prove ourselves, to prove who Ashutosh Roy is. That. It's very important. It, it, it it's actually works in all our minds. Even when I have changed many jobs in my life, when I work, the first day I walk into my new employer's office, I'm very excited. The butterflies inside my stomach because there's a need to prove myself. The organization has reposed, reposed faith in me, recruited me, but I also have a strong desire to prove that I am the best. I am excellent. Because as human beings, we are always, the education system in our country is such, we've got a lot of educationists out here, pardon me if I'm saying so, we create a rat race for our students. We, we are always teaching them to run, compete, and win. 
as if everybody has to win everybody cannot win in life my friend so don't first of all my submission to you is please don't stress yourself that you have to be the winner always and every time get it out of your mind you'll burn yourself by the age of 30 i can assure you that people are burning out by the age of 35 because they are getting into this rat race of proving that i am the winner you will be the winner give yourself some time life is a marathon career is a marathon career is not a 100 meters flat race you need not be a carl lewis you need not be ben johnson you can always be a marathon winner and take your life in a very structured manner yes in the first phase of your career when you join an organization the way you make your mark or or an impression on the organization or on your immediate super, uh, superior or the team where you work is they want a person who wants to learn because if they recruit a fresh graduate or even an mba from a college we are bubbling with energy we have got a lot of things and when you go into a system you tend to find a lot of loopholes are eta kan eram bhabe korche ota kan oram bhabe korche i can't change it overnight that happens you feel restless and then in that urge to prove yourself without knowing the context of the organization because organization is evolved and matured by the experience of people they know it right they have they have created the organization and made the organization brought the organization to current state so maybe what you are saying is right but then take your time understand the ethos the culture and the values of the organization and then come up with your suggestions don't shoot from the hip don't be restless don't be over excited and over enthusiastic because maybe if you uh, take a bit more of time calm yourself down let the adrenaline set down you will figure out that okay what i'm saying is right but then this can further be modified because the organization operates in this axis or this manner so if you take some time understand the organization and also be a learner be an eager learner show your eagerness to absorb and learn the nuances of the organization people will be forthcoming and willing to teach you to also coach you and take you in the way otherwise they'll feel that another young kid has come from the block and he is there to turn the world uh, he is going to turn the world upside down bring about a revolution like a lot of college students do nowadays i will not get into the controversial part of it uh, so we have also done it during our college days so don't try to create a revolution overnight because try to understand the organization uh try to be a learner keen learner be observant and come up with your suggestions at the right time don't try to show off your knowledge be humble humility is very very important these are some of the elements which will help you to get noticed in an organization and people will think that okay this guy has got a sensible head on his shoulders let's give him more responsibilities let's give him more assignments let's try him out that will give you the opportunities to further work on yourself and showcase your talent thank you sir uh- Uh, it seems as almost i overdo trying to prove myself trying to have a good impression that i have a bad impression instead now that Actually, i think of that it, happens to all of us it, it would have happened to me it would have happened to any one of us so uh, let's not uh, you don't feel bad about it because that's the excitement of young age uh, 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 that starts from impressing a woman to impressing your boss so it happens to all of us the first day you walked into college and saw a pretty girl in your class you would have gone out of the way to impress her uh, and that would have happened when you go to your, your organization you would be going uh, head of uh, you you would have go f- full steam to uh, impress your boss or your team that this is the guy this is the elon musk of this world who's arrived i'm going to buy out coca cola day after tomorrow before elon musk buys it Uh, so just, mm, I'll be more careful sir. Yeah, just be a bit more careful. But don't give up on your ambition and your zeal to win. Do it with a guarded. Be a bit more guarded, be more cautious. That's what I'm saying. 
Don't try to hit Don't the ball from the ball one. Okay, sir. Okay, sir. Then what will what is happening? KKR openers will happen to you. I certainly won't let that happen to me. Yeah. So, Ashutosh, you're satisfied with this? Then we can move on with the next uh, question. Right. Yes, ma'am, satisfied. Okay. okay. Please okay. go ahead Please with the next question. Who's next? Sneha, uh, maybe you, you can ask the question if he is not uh, audible or. Oh, yeah, he's and online. He's good on. evening to all of us who is present up here. My question to sir is that, as you know, past few years are couple of past few years are very difficult for us uh, in view of COVID nineteen pandemic. So my question to you, sir, while hiring fresh candidate nowadays, what an employer should be look into? Uh, this, this for fresh candidates, certainly the domain skill is there, Vishikesh. Domain skill will always be there. Yes, uh, during the pandemic, uh, life has gone for a, a total redefinition because uh, the way we have experienced the life and uh, we are looking at life ahead. A lot of things, a lot of normal uh, rules of life have undergone a, a paradigm shift. So when... I'll just tell you from my perspective, if I recruit a young talent nowadays, which we do, in fact, I've got 42 people joining on Monday in my organization, engineers. What we, the most significant skill for any employer, be it pandemic, non-pandemic, Rishikesh, is social skills. Emotional quotient of an individual. Because you're likely to work in an, in an ecosystem, Rishikesh, where... Uh, you might have a hybrid organization, right? Some people may be working out of home. Some people may be working on site. Depends on the nature of operations of the organization. And because of this pandemic, a lot of companies have calibrated into a hybrid model of working. That helps an organization uh, without compromising on productivity and output or efficiency to manage their costs better because infrastructure costs have come down because you don't have to it, uh, keep such a big office. I've known offices, I, my office in Sector 5, Salt Lake, so I know a lot of offices who used to have four or five stories or four or five floors, sorry, uh, in their uh, uh, organization have just got one story, one floor, because they've uh, let out the uh, four other floors because they've said that, okay, I don't need to have all my employees coming on every day. So employees have to book their workplaces, workstations, come, for four hours, they can work out of home or work out of uh, anywhere they want. So, one is, so in that sort of a network hybrid environment, Rishikesh, when you're not meeting your colleagues on a day to day basis, because an organization is typically an extension of our social setup, because you spend eight to 10 hours, we used to spend in an organization where you meet your colleagues, they become part of your social ecosystem, right? So you like to spend time with them. Now, suddenly that has changed. You will be working with a lot of people across geographies, across time zones, network in a, uh, in a networked environment where your boss may be in some other part of the country. I'm not even going international, maybe in Bangalore, and you are operating out of, say, Durgapur. Just, but you're doing your job, but you're not meeting your colleagues. You're not going for a coffee in the cafeteria. You are stuck in your room. They have given you all the gadgets. They have given you a allowance. They will give you everything. But you are not meeting your boss. You are having the Zoom meetings like we are doing today. And so this social connect of ability to stay connected socially, understand the emotions and social needs of your fellow colleagues is very, very important. And that's going to be a differentiator in terms of soft skills which will differentiate the success of one employee vis-a-vis -vis another employee. Because that was always a differentiator, Rishikesh. The capability to relate to people, to manage people, to work with people between a leader and a manager. A leader inspires, a manager gets work done. That was always the differentiator. But then in a hybrid world, which is getting every day you're finding pandemic opening up in some other part of the world. China is shut down now. Hong Kong is shut down. 
You never know whether we are in for a fourth wave. Delhi is seeing a spurt of cases. You don't know how life is going to be re recalibrated every three months in spite of the booster dose, in spite of this, that. So you have to be very emotionally connected with your employees because you're not seeing them. You're not meeting them. You're always on the virtual platform. And at the same time, when you're working out of home, there are social pressures of home at working on you. So managing the mind, ability to stay calm in a hybrid working environment, digital environment, Rishikesh is a very stressful environment. I didn't enjoy it for two years, to be honest. I'm very happy going back to work in the physical space. I know professors went through hell, teachers went through hell teaching on the digital platform. And students had a ball of a time. They used to just log on and you never know whether the student is on there on the other side of the platform. Because you can always switch off your video and um, play a game on the monitor. So teachers had a harrowing time. And even students. Because interacting with a student and teacher in the class is much more engaging. Because you see each other's body language, you learn. And the kids especially have suffered. Two years of education has just suffered. So people are finding it difficult to get back to normal life. So this emotional quotient, Rishikesh, ability to connect to people in a world where in all likelihood hybrid is there to stay is very, very important. Your domain knowledge, I'm not getting into the higher skills now because you're just starting your career. But ability to relate to your colleagues in a digital space is very, very going to be a huge game changer for individuals. Thank you so much, sir, for your kind words. Okay, sir, before we move on to the next question, uh, there is a question that we've received from uh, a student called Himank, uh, who is studying English honors and is in the sixth semester. May I please uh, ask the question? Sir, am I audible? Yeah, you are audible. Please. Okay, oh, I thought okay, okay. you asked yeah. the question. Yeah, I just, yeah. How do I get myself into BDM firms and mentor myself for it, considering I get into an IIM with 99 plus cat percentile? It's a uh, question from a student. No, I, I, can you repeat the first part of the question? I just yeah, missed sure, it. Sir, sure, sir. How do I get myself into BBM firms and mentor myself for it? Considering I get into an IIM with a 99 plus cat percentile. So she's doing an English honors already. Yeah, he is doing an English honors already. And uh, this is the question for her. And she her. wants to do a BBM after that. Yeah. How does he get into BBM firms? And if we consider that he is getting 99 plus cat percentile and is into some IIM. I, I would advise her that uh, I assume she's a young lady. Uh, he, sir. Himang. Himang. Okay, Himang. Uh, uh, Himang, why do you want to do a BBM? Just go for your cat after your English honors. I but and then uh, get a 90, 99 percentile will not get you the best of uh, colleges. I can assure you, my friend. It has a 99.89 or 99.9 percentile. So the world is really bad, to be honest. I don't want to sound demotivating. Now you nowadays you can see Delhi University giving 100%. And Delhi University cutoff for St. Stephen's economics is 100%. This is a joke. Education has become a joke in certain parts of this country. 100%. Uh, I, I know Dr. Sengupta is uh, smiling on the other side because in our Jadavpur days, we couldn't imagine such weird percentages of marks. Absolutely. It, it, 60 to 70 would have been considered very high. Yes. So, so when you're talking about uh, to get into Hansraj College, you need 97%. Must be, must be an absolute joke. So it's more fictitious than reality. So I would, I would say that uh, uh, prepare for your cat. Don't wait. Don't finish your English honors. But while you're doing your English honors, please prepare for your cat with utmost uh, sincerity and commitment. I uh, don't know how good you are in quantitative want because we humanity students, I'm equally a humanity student, but then uh, I did science with economics in class 11 and 12, but I wanted to do humanities because I thought that I was not cut out for physics or chemistry and nor did I crack the joint. So that's a reality also. So I took an easier route of doing a graduation. That's political science because I was into cricket in those days. So I would advise you that 
while you're doing your English honors, don't further get into a BBM or something of that sort, please. That's a, you, you already spent three years in doing a graduation program, just do another, don't do a double graduation program. Uh, prepare for your CAT, enroll yourself on, into one of these uh, innumerable uh, coaching centers, but do a reality check in terms of uh, the way they teach you and whether they give you GDPI uh, options, uh, courses, and go for it in from the second year itself, start preparing yourself. So don't uh, go for another BBM program because that doesn't give you an edge because your English honors graduate is good enough. Sir, he has just clarified his question once again through WhatsApp group that uh, what he wanted to ask clearly was uh, how does he get into the best of the consulting firms that's there, like McKinsey. Oh, okay. And, okay. Yeah, that's what he's trying to uh, okay. say. You, you were talking about McKinsey's and the BCG's right. and the main right. consultants right. of this world. Yeah, the top consulting firms. How My they friend, they only go to the top B schools, unfortunately. Or they go to a Stephen's. Or they, but the job they give uh, to uh, when they take graduates, even from Stephens or from LSR and uh, Dedi Shriram and uh, SRCC uh, Delhi, is typically a lot of data crunching and uh, back end data analysis. They, they call them data analysts, but then it's hardly a data analyst. It's basically taking dump from an international server and putting them into a some sort of a form and a shape. So if you want to actually do well in a consulting firm, uh, be the BCGs or the McKenzies of the world. You have to go to a, a top business school in this country, ABCL, to be honest. Ahmedabad, Bangalore, Calcutta, Lucknow. Uh, to a certain extent, Cozy Code. But uh, yes, and uh, maybe Excel, MDI, Gurgaon. These are the uh, top 10 you can, uh, you have to go for if you're looking at this. Any of these options which you've called. Okay, sir. Thank you so much. Now, moving on to the next question. Who do we have next? Good evening, sir. Good evening, everyone. It's Ayush on this side. Sir, a little while uh, earlier, you just said that many of the companies these days, they, under the banner of fancy designation, they basically exploit the young grads. So, sir, I had a very similar question that how shall a fresher or any employee uh, differentiate between a good corporate environment uh, with uh, the toxic, any toxic culture? Also, sir, can you suggest some of the ways one can cope up with such situation? Uh, Ayush, uh, my advice uh, or submission to people like you uh, who uh, who like to figure out whether an organization is good or uh, believes in good practices or does not believe in good practice, I, toxic is a very uh, strong word to use. I would rather say that good uh, people culture and not so good people culture, to be honest. It's very important to uh, do a lot of uh, research work on there, go to their websites, study their values, vision. Uh, their, uh, most of these companies who are good in their people practices, if, I, if you, I, I've started my career with the Tatas, so I know Tatas are an employee-friendly organization or an Aditya Birla group or a Indusan Unilever. They have robust people practice. And if you go to their website, you'll typically find a lot of these success stories about people doing well. And they, they will showcase their policies, their values, their mission statement, their vision. So that, to a certain extent, will give you some flavor about the organization. I agree and understand that unless you taste uh, the pudding, you cannot make out how good or bad it is. But then uh, also you need to figure out from, uh, keep your eyes and ears open, read a lot of business newspapers. Uh, uh, read, uh, listen to a lot of uh, business news, if it's possible, because now it's a digital world. You guys are always on the on the mobile, on the move. Uh, spend some time to do through and uh, in, invest in reading a digital economic times or digital business standard. Uh, Facebook time is important. I appreciate that. Insta is important. Insta reels are important. I all I appreciate all these because that's the normal ecosystem. You cannot do away with them. That's part of your life also. But then. Imbibe this also as part of your life to do a bit more of R&D about the organization. But not always all that glitters is gold, as they say. So at times, companies are able to camouflage their bad. So, uh, But at least if you are informed, you take a better informed decision rather than making a like a blind 
in a uh, in a in a in a team party that you have you play blind and you <laughs> just leave it to destiny to win or not to win right it's not russian yes. rule or something of that sort so please be a bit more informed about the organization when an organization is coming to your campus do a bit pre reading about the organization if your seniors are there talk to them if they have not done if they have not got a good experience none of the seniors say good things uh, about an organization if it's actually not good to their juniors they want their juniors boss ekhane esho na kintu ami chapi chhere dite jaichi main i myself think you're leaving this job so talk to your seniors if it's possible if they are available in those companies go to into the website do a bit of uh, research work about the organization but then in spite of that it may not work but at least you have a fair bit of information you take an informed decision uh they have uh, uh may i uh, just uh, ask mr banerjee just a small thing i'm very interested to know his uh, take on this okay uh should i uh, this is chandra chandramundi uh, actually i just uh, was interested to know the, your take on this particular answer because you know suppose somebody joins and then somebody realizes that the situation was not as he or she has expected like there is a camouflage and he or she has been fooled by the camouflage in joining institution found that situation is not pretty people friendly but then maybe there is no other option but to work there so if you could just um, Uh, share with us uh, some insights or you know some some ways uh, of how a person who has to stay in that organization for some reason or the other deal uh, you know with not such a people friendly atmosphere maybe many of my colleagues also or many of the senior students who have passed out and are in the youtube listening to your talk would love to know this i have a different opinion on this uh, i i have never stayed in organizations where like you know me you know it pretty well chandra uh, mundi uh i have changed about 13 jobs in my life when i remember <laughs> so even if i if, whenever i have not liked a company i have left it and i always had the right reasons to explain to my previous uh, to my future employer so i don't want to get in when to be honest i and today the opportunities are much more than what we had in the early 90s or early 2000 also and it was not seen in good spirit or good a uh, picture when an when a person left his or her job very frequently but in today's world the shelf life of a professional a young professional in an organization is max 3 years and there are people who are leaving leaving jobs saying that the organizational culture is bad they don't respect people whatever they have claimed is all wrong and youngsters are not afraid of telling the telling the truth and and now uh hr professionals or organizations are also welcoming this thought process of youngsters who are not willing to compromise on their basic values the basic uh, philosophy of life and if it is not in alignment with the organizational culture which was promised to them in the campus if they leave a job it is not taken against them now because then but it has to be genuine it has to be real it cannot be for reason that my boss was had shouted at me once because i did not live up to the expectations uh, on a particular assignment and therefore i feel the organization is bad no it cannot be a single incident which makes you or one uh, take a call about the organization at large it may be one experience with an individual but that does not reflect you the entire organization so if you are saying that my boss is bad that's a separate story if you are saying the organization is not good that's a separate story but if you if but you need to have solid clear justifiable anecdotes or illustrations to prove your point because if you're leaving a organization going to b organization and if you're talking ill about your a organization you need to be very sure that you're sticking your neck out and saying that i had expected this in my previous organization for which i had gone there because they had told me they're going to give me this not money don't talk about money because money you knew what they were offering so you cannot say that they had offered me 100 rupees they gave me 175 rupees no that's not a sellable reason if you feel that okay that organization believes in this sort of ethos values culture but when i went in there i found it's totally different you will tell them why you're saying what you are saying then please don't suffer if day in and day out in an organization by getting tied to it because 
the more you suffer your productivity comes down the organization where you work does not get the best out of you because you're not satisfied and it also affects your mental and physical health it's not worth it so at times you go take a hard call i have known people who have left organizations just like that stayed without a job for 3 months but got the right job and nowadays people are looking at the right job which is aligned to them as an individual to their values to their principles and not just looking for money i know i am graduates leaving jobs age of 33 34 high paying jobs in startups in in fintech companies in consulting firms which my friend was talking about the bcgs and the mckinseys of the world and joining and becoming social entrepreneurs or joining ngos because that's giving them a meaning to their life it's not always money they're looking for they're looking for an assignment which makes them look at life in a holistic manner and pandemic has taught us a lot of things that life is not always money life has a lot of other dimensions so please don't get afraid of losing of chucking a job maybe staying at home for two months it's going to be a financial stress but then it's worth the happiness you are getting into that's my submission thank you uh okay going to the last question for the session uh, who do we have left good evening sir good evening so myself anand kumar das so my question is what inspired you to choose this line of business and what is your mantra or approach regarding your esteemed organization succession and development uh first of all you asked me why i chose this line of business my profession hr is that the question yes sir because you know line of business what i didn't understand is it which line of business are you talking about sir uh, hr profession hr profession anand i didn't have an option i told you right at the beginning main to engineer tha nahi mere se doc medical practitioner maine medical bhi nahi pass kiya and as ca bhi nahi tha so i i had what option marketing mere se jamta nahi i was not interested in going out and selling stuff so by default i started hr my friend i was not so informed like you guys are so uh, dr sen gupta knows me she knows me from my college in jadavpur i used to be gallivanting in jadavpur without knowing what to do then my parents told me high time you do something in life i had some people who used to work in hr in those days they said that excel chale jao exercise chale jao excel mila lekin interview mein crack nahi kar paye the exercise chale gaye do saal padhai kiye wahan pe i studied out there for two years i was a topper in my batch job got my first job wahan ja ke realize kiye ki boss everybody is coming here for a job and my father has spent his hard earned money तो अभी तो मेरे को कुछ करना चाहिए सो देन आई स्टडीड बिटवीन 88 एंड 90 टू बी ऑनेस्ट जम के पढ़ाई किए नौकरी मिल गई उसके बाद ऐश किए पिछले 30 साल से सो माय चॉइस ऑफ लाइन ऑफ माय फंक्शन एज ए मोर बाय डिफॉल्ट डोंट गिव आंसर्स लॉट ऑफ पीपल आई गो टू कैंपसेस से व्हाई वी चोजन एचआर बिकॉज़ आई लव इंटरैक्टिंग विद पीपल डोंट गिव सच आंसर्स प्लीज फॉर गॉड सेक यू कैन ऑलवेज से आई हैव हर्ड अबाउट एचआर एचआर इज अ स्ट्रेटजिक a uh, function organize the people form the core of an organization i want to work with people i'm comfortable working with people but lot of people give the cliched answer no no i work i love working interacting with people then you work, could have joined gone to sales and marketing also that's also people interaction why suddenly is love for hr hr we also when we go to campuses we know you guys are going to give give us a very rehearsed answer so we don't judge a candidate by that answer but then if it's a bit more from the heart if you say that okay whatever i've learned about hr from people i've interacted i feel that i'll be comfortable in a profession like hr where i have to deal with people on a day to day basis i want to uh, drive success of an organization through people because i feel that people are the the core of the dna of the organization you can have product you can have technology you can have money but if you don't have the people who's going to deliver that is give this sort of these are also rehearsed answers but these sound a bit close to reality rather than saying i like interacting with people so coming to my line of my choice 32 years back i had no choice so i chose this profession i'm very candid and upfront okay 
What is your mantra or approach regarding your esteemed oil succession and development? That's the talent management framework that we as an organization, we believe in. And that's the framework we've created. Because when you recruit talent in an organization, it's very, it, the onus lies on the organization to nurture and leverage that talent. Because like the employee owes it to the organization to deliver, the organization is equally responsible to ensure that the employee remains engaged with the organization, feels connected emotionally with the organization. Because my emotional connect will come with the organization when I know the organization is making an effort for my growth and development, career, career growth and development. So learning and development, succession planning, career management are all the subsystems of a larger ecosystem of talent management. So succession and development are just subsets of this talent management framework. We call it the talent management framework because you manage a talent, you nurture the talent, you leverage the talent and give the talent an opportunity to evolve and excel. And succession and development are integral parts of it. You create a succession plan for every position in the organization. Every position has an immediate succession plan, a mid-term succession plan, a long-term succession plan. I need to know that if a person, if Anand Kumar leaves my organization tomorrow, do I have a second man to immediately replace him? Or if I don't have, what are the development needs I need to give to this number two who is more or less ready to move into Anand Kumar's role the moment he decides to leave? Are you getting my point? So readiness of the employee is very important to create his development plan, which is a function of the succession plan. And employees must see, must experience the organization as some as an organization which invests in its learning and development and provides opportunities to grow, which is a derivative of the succession plan. Thank you, sir, for explaining and giving us this opportunity to end the wonderful webinar. As a student, I always remember your precious word. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you, Anand. Pleasure. Thank you, Sia, ma'am. Sia, you're mute. Thank you so much, sir, for sharing such valuable insights. Not saying it because this is a typical line which is supposed to be said, but because I am myself from the Domain Human Resources, and I'm thankful that this was such a big learning opportunity for me as well. So thank you for everything that you spoke and the exposure that you gave. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so um, much, Mia. Pleasure interacting with the students. I would like to thank Dr. Sengupta. I, I, I'm finding it difficult to call her Dr. Sengupta, actually, to be honest. Yes, please don't. Please don't. It makes me, it makes me laugh. Because we've known each other for the last 40 years now, so uh, 35, 40 years. So she, she, she's family to me, so I find it very difficult. But I would have to thank her officially on this digital platform. Thank you, Chandramoli. Yeah, it was our our pleasure and our honor all the way. Our our event has been greatly, greatly you know, enriched by your wonderful talk. Okay, anchors, please take over here. So may I may I log off? Debustuti Priyanka, please thank sir and uh, let him uh, Thank you so much, sir, for enlightening our students in the field of management. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Priyanka. Thank you for inviting me. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, now I would like to introduce and invite our third speaker for the session, Dr. Shupatra Sen. Dr. Sen completed her BSc, MSc, MAD, MPhil and PhD from the University of Calcutta. An alumnus of Presidency College, she is currently Associate Professor in the Department of Botany, Ashutosh College, Kolkata. She has published nearly a hundred international books, papers, and reviews. An academic career spanning three decades, she has edited several UGC-funded ISBN volumes. Her research interests are environmental stress physiology and biochemical ecology. She won the Environmentalist of the Year Award in 2014 and the Best Faculty Award in 2017. She is the founder and chief editor of ISSN peer-reviewed multidisciplinary academic journal Harvest since 2016. With this, we invite you on the platform, ma'am.
मैडम थैंक यू प्रियंका थैंक यू मैम एम आई ऑडिबल यस मैडम यू आर ऑडिबल एंड आर द स्लाइड्स विजिबल यस मैडम दे आर विजिबल थैंक यू एवरी वन सो हियर्स योर लास्ट स्पीकर फॉर द डे research as a sustainable career so uh um, research earliest recorded use is in 15th century which means seeking or quest so research would be creative and systematic work undertaken to increase the stock of knowledge it is anything that creates and creates systematically would involve the collection organization and analysis of information to increase the understanding of the topic this is the basic concept because we might want to know what research is all about since i am uh, basically addressing uh, the ug students or maybe a few um, i do not know whether the uh, pg ones are here but they are not very familiar with the concept of research so this is something that is creative something that has to be done systematically collection organization and analysis of information to increase the understanding of a particular topic or a particular issue so it is the creation of new knowledge and also the use of existing knowledge in a new and creative way so the word creative keeps coming back and when we move into research we know that we are into a creative domain completely now this is diverse this field is very diverse and research currently is transdisciplinary because as there are different disciplines as there are different subjects as people have different you know uh, areas of interest similarly their research their quest their seeking would be in different areas they could be in the life sciences they could be in engineering arts humanities social sciences and more in fact uh, we Uh, heard two previous speakers uh one on administration and the previous on uh in his field of hr etc management to be precise you could even research in, in those areas so from statistical analysis to demographic investigations it could be anything it could be philosophical research it could be of historical relevance so it is this transdisciplinary character of research which actually invites collaboration because academics nowadays is promoting a lot of collaboration we ourselves from ashutosh college have you know uh, six people from six different disciplines have written a paper on covid 19 so it is this uh, transdisciplinary character of research which will foster collaboration and you could be working uh, with friends and colleagues from different disciplines from different countries from different universities so it's a very very diverse world we began when research began uh, initially in the initial stages that is uh, it was restricted to a particular discipline we moved to multidisciplinary then to interdisciplinary and finally the more complex transdisciplinary where we find that you know uh, the borders are not discrete they are not distinct but the di the different disciplines they have merged into one another so the dividing line is not very clear the dividing line is not very sharp we have beautifully merged the whole thing as a knowledge to me and it's only the perspective which matters and not really the discipline 
So access to information is very important. This is one of the uh, primary things of research. And you could gather that information in every possible way, through interviews, through questionnaires, through libraries, archives, newspaper clippings, your encyclopedia, magazines and periodicals, case laws, legislative records, all these, you could gather information from anywhere and everywhere, from historical documents, public opinion polls, and of course, last but not the least, computers, which play a pivotal role in the collection and organization of data. Because without computers, we would be so blind. We would be so helpless nowadays. So uh, there is an information boom. We are living in the age of information. And for research, the preliminary thing that you require is a lot of information. It's, in fact, it's a lot. It's a great deal. And when I say a lot, it truly is a lot. Capital L-O-T, that is. Uh, information in every way. Now, you have to be a many in one. That is, depending on the field of research, in whichever field you are researching, if it is instrument-based, if, is, if it requires technical knowledge, then you must be sound in the technical area. You must have adequate knowledge or information about the instrumentation techniques. That is if you're working with instruments and techniques. On the other hand, your communication skills must be good because you'll be called up to present, to defend your thesis, to present your paper, to give online presentations, to go for different seminars and uh, symposia, conferences. So you need good uh, uh, and very strong communication skills. Be able to relate to people. Yes, this is one very important aspect because especially people from science, since I come from a life science background myself, you know, we tend to forget the social implications. We tend to overlook, we tend to bypass the cultural context, the place where you're living and you're conducting that research on the people you're supposed to be, you know, the, the people that you're supposed to be working for, your target group. So that social context and that cultural context is very, very important. In whichever branch you may be in, but you cannot... You cannot uh, bypass the social and the cultural context. Excellent writing skills, because at the end of the day, you need to publish. You need to publish your work, whether it be a paper, whether it be a journal, whether it be a book, you need to publish yourself. So excellent writing skills. And finally, the last word in everything, that is patience and objectivity. If there is any, any quality that you truly need in research, you know, is a never give up attitude. So you have to be at it continuously. Patience and objectivity. So you're many in one. Now, uh, there could be different processes. There could be different ways of carrying out uh, the work. The research process uh, could comprise broadly, you know, I have uh, divided this into the research proposal, which is identifying your area of interest or the study area, choosing the topic, the special topic that you wish to work on, then formulating your plan and your methodology of work, the method that you are going to follow, the experiments that you are going to undertake, the surveys that you will carry out, you know, the work plan that is. Research activity will comprise of collecting data and analysis and interpretation of data. So collection, just mere collection is not enough. You have to interpret. And interpretation is very important. There lies your personal skill, analysis and interpretation. You can all see a movie or read a book or read a paper, but how you interpret it will set you apart from the rest. And there lies your special and your unique skill. And then finally, the written content. I have told you before, 
that you need to fit, be very strong with your words. You need to write well. You need to communicate well. So your findings are to be presented for publication, etc. Now, research could be right for you. Research may not be right for you. As my speakers previously, the speakers previously have pointed out, every career may not be to your choice and taste. Now, a career in research, it should broaden your mind. It will give you a wider perspective, a wider view of things. Every observation will matter. Everything that you observe will matter. There is nothing that will not have any relevance. So every observation counts. The analysis is your unique skill. So that is very crucial. It will be an ongoing process. So you can never say, I'm done with it. This is over. So this is uh, when we are talking of sustainability. You will sustain research and research will sustain you. So this is an ongoing process, completely ongoing, lifelong. It's a lifelong learning process. Accuracy, precision, these would be just as important as critical thinking and analysis. Analysis, I, I harp, I keep saying that critical thinking and analysis are your unique skills which are meant to be developed and, you know, nurtured. Now, research definitely after even listening to this for uh, five or seven or ten minutes, you would realize that this is one of the most challenging fields. In fact, this is one of the superbly, fiercely competitive fields. And that is why not a very popular field, I would say. It is challenging. There have been breakthroughs. There have been, you know, uh, miracles of, uh, you know, research breakthroughs in natural sciences, in the human sciences, in medical science. We've done everything almost, but still a lot remains. So it's one of the most challenging fields that you can expect to be. You would have to pay attention to details. You would need to have very good problem-solving skills without losing your head because be prepared that every time you're going to, you know, take up a new route, you will meet a dead end. So if you give up and say, well, I'm done with it, and now it's time for me to switch to another profession, then definitely this field is not for you. So you need to have complex problem-solving skills. You must be very cool and very clear about what you wish to find out and what is it that you are driving at. Resourcefulness and tenacity. As I said, patience, endurance, you need that. And that is why most research councils will fund the different projects and all that you give them for submission on the quality of the proposal. How feasible. It may not be a very ambitious research proposal, but it must be something that is honest. Very often, you know, we make this mistake. We write a very ambitious research proposal and we think that uh, why did it not get sanctioned? but it has to be a very honest one as well. Because remembering your, you know, infrastructure and your resources, you should be very honest to your work. Only then will your research matter. Only then will it contribute to knowledge. So this is both dynamic and innovative. This, is, this can really make a difference. If you decide on a career in research, this could make a difference to your life because you're innovating all the time. You're thinking of routes which no one has taken before. You're trying to do something new. Even if it is already existing knowledge, you are taking a new perspective of things. You are taking a different outlook of the entire matter. So it is something that is innovative. It will make a difference in your life and naturally, it should and it will, if you're honest to your work, it will make a difference in the lives of others as well. So this is both dynamic and innovative. It gives you new ideas. 
you can experiment with different technologies you can meet interesting people if you're working with you know uh, communication if you're a, a social science researcher you can meet interesting people you can take part in engaging discussions so you know it's a very varied world that is and finally you're part of the think tank yes it is extremely valued being a researcher is something that may not get you a lot of money but it is very rewarding in its own way because you're part of the think tank of any institution you may be drawing a salary which may be lower or which may be equivalent to the others but if you are a researcher it would only mean that you are adding to your organization more than what the others are doing because your thinking your innovation your input is going to push your organization forward so you're actually the think tank of your organization the entry the formal entry for research would be after post graduation after your pg that is but the preparation could be in earlier you know you could observe you could write down you could uh, you know make notes and they must be your own research deals very severely with plagiarism there is no place for any plagiarism in research plagiarism for the undergraduate students would mean that you are taking others ideas you are taking their uh, work your you know copy pasting that is to put it in plain and simple terms your copy pasting but there is no place for plagiarism in research this should ordinarily uh, normally that is this would lead to your phd this could be either in india or you could do it abroad if you wish to go abroad if you have the resources if you have the will power you can carry it uh, out abroad and you can continue it thereafter as i said this is life law this is definitely the sustainable the most sustainable profession of all for the initial steps you have to choose the right mentor now this is a lot of luck very frankly this is a lot of luck i personally had the best mentor in my opinion but not everyone is as lucky as i am so getting the right mentor is very very important choosing the right department and the academic the department because you know your area of interest may be something but the fellowships may be lying somewhere now you need a fellowship for research you need money research is a very very costly affair you cannot carry out research you know pay money from your own pocket so the fellowship may be elsewhere your interest may be somewhere and a good mentor may be in another discipline altogether so all these you know you will have to come to some sort of a you know a baseline that is where you get a fairly good mentor someone that you can work under and you don't have to you know have a nervous breakdown in the middle of your research career the proper department when you have when you have adequate interest and also the funds the available fellowships the application must be written properly the research application especially this is very important for people going abroad the application must be right and funding nothing happens without funding now the careers for researchers you could get jobs in universities now that's a long list but it's not that easy very frankly it's not that easy the list is long but as i said initially it's fiercely competitive you have to really 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 outdo your very best you have to do better than your best that is because there are better people and better you know publications uh, people who are extremely experienced in their uh, own field so you have to be really good you could get jobs in universities in government laboratories in teaching as we are doing in administration there are some posts there too you could get support roles in training and development human resources just the speaker before public engagement and career professionals and work in research related services or projects like in policy and funding grant administration etc so uh, 
the choice is vast, but then again, it is difficult to get. You have to do your very best. Now, from research positions, more on careers, well, you can have uh, research positions in commercial companies, in public bodies, or even in the defense sector, sometimes in non-profit organizations, to research-related positions like research policy and administration. And also, you know, directly the roles may not be related to research, but the knowledge and the skills of researchers can prove advantages. The skill that you have developed as a researcher can be advantageous uh, in fields like consultancy, in publishing, in patent law, manufacturing companies, and so on and so forth. The most sought after jobs for research and after research would be naturally the university, especially in our country, the industrial lab professionals, then financial to public, you will find the PhD graduates everywhere. Because nowadays, the PhDs are not merely sticking to uh, teaching and research, but they are moving in other sectors. They are moving into other sectors as well. Like, for instance, science writing, scientific advisor. Of course, you have the topmost person of a company with a very brilliant research career as the scientific advisor. You can have a patent lawyer, you can, if uh, you're into medical science, then you could, uh, instead of being just a medical practitioner, there are some doctors who move into medical research and development, uh, development centers. So uh, there is a varied choice. Now, researchers, particularly in the field of biotechnology, because that is uh, especially uh, my uh, area, because since I come from a background of life science, uh, biotechnology in the pharmaceutical industry, in the software field, the avenues are uh, endless. So you could you know, make your choice from there. And the biotechnology sector, this is now a very, very you know, a lucrative and a flourishing industry. And some of the best research brains, uh, not only from life science, but also from the chemical sciences, from uh, physics, etc., they are moving in. Uh, to this field, because this is a very lucrative and a very, you know, flourishing industry. And the Indian pharmaceutical industry, it stands at 238665. This is an internet data, actually. And uh, 238665 crore, and it's also expanding naturally. Post the pandemic, uh, you can expect that in the years to come, this would even go up in leaps and bounds. With pandemics and, you know, diseases on the run, Naturally, the pharmaceutical industry will mint money. Now, what is the research potential of India? India, in fact, it has a very sound, she has a very sound research potential, uh, has contributed a lot to this field. We have over one lakh PhD holders. But that's a tragedy, really. As we are boasting, uh, you know, of one lakh over 1 lakh PhD holders because we do not have enough jobs for them. So uh, there may be positions uh, in the government sector, in the university, in the colleges, uh, you know, in the different companies, organizations, but then again, not enough for over 1 lakh. And definitely this number is increasing in leaps and bounds. And the World Bank report on unleashing India's innovation potential estimates that there are around 3 lakh scientists and innovators in this country. So, flourishing, but still, uh, you know, they're not, it's, it's, they're definitely flourishing, but they themselves are not very well placed. They face uh, inadequacy of funds, they face threat. We've just read about a suicide uh, by a researcher, I think a couple of weeks back, so there is always the threat, there is insecurity, there is, you know, uh, plagiarism, the threat of your data getting stolen. So uh, though we have a lot of potential in our country, still for the individual researcher, life's not very easy. Now to get into all this, you would have to qualify the CSIR net, that's for science and for UGC, uh, you have uh, the humanities uh, for the, the UGC exam, CSR net, 
JRF, which stands for Junior Research Fellowship, and you also have the UGC net for the humanities subjects. You also have the state level exams, which you can uh, qualify to get into formal research. The names of some institutes, there are many others. No point, you know, giving a list of all this. I have just named a few. Uh, you have, uh, you just have to go to the net and you have to put in your discipline and you have to just, you know, do a Google and you'll find that uh, outcome, uh, the, uh, the result outcome you will get. You will get a number of institutes, both in India and abroad, where you have the option of choosing. In India, very famous, we have the Indian Institute of Science, we have the IITs, you have the IISCRs, the National Institutes of Technology, etc. I'm not going to read out because uh, you can see the slides. And for the social sciences, there is uh, the ICSSR recognized institutes. I think there are about 30 of them. And then you have the Indian Institute of Advanced Studies in Simla for the humanities subjects. The universities also carry out a lot of research. Uh, most of the university departments carry out a lot of research. Some of the uh, colleges, even at the college level, a lot of research is going on. Some of the undergraduate departments are also now very equipped if they have, you know, uh, if they have good faculty and uh, if they have equipped labs, that is for science, you could even carry out, uh, you know, some research there. At least you could start preparing for the days ahead. There are a number of uh, fellowships available. Just visit the UGC website and you will be finding the different fellowships which are available the different, you know, uh, areas where these fellowships are given, the different universities and the institutes where they are provided. You just have to go to the UGC uh, website. Uh, this is for the fellowships and the scholarships for engineering, humanities, arts, a compiled list. Now, what is uh, the West Bengal research scenario like? We have a number of uh, very famous research institutes, in fact, legendary uh, research institutes, if I may say so. The Indian Statistical Institute, Bose Institute, IICB, the Cultivation of Science, Saha Institute of Nuclear Physics, NYSED, SN Bose, it's a long list. And then, of course, we have the universities and the colleges carrying on. So, it's basically an enriching scenario, but there is a big but because not many people, we do not find, you know, very many students nowadays interested in research, interested in carrying out research. These are also the names of the different uh, institutes in West Bengal. Uh, you have SIFRI, you have CMRI, you have all these Trijev for Duke research where very good work is being carried out. In fact, they publish very quality of, you know, research papers. Now, how can you make out whether that institute is good, uh, is is uh, is a good research institute is by the quality of its publications. Publications are an integral part of research. In fact, research and publications would go hand in hand. Whatever you research will not reach the community until and unless you are able to publish it in a standard journal. And for that, you need to find a journal uh, which would, you know, accept your paper, review it, give suggestions, and then finally would accept your work for publication. All right. So this is for research abroad. You need all this. If you wish to go abroad, you need high academic grades. You need previous research work, that is, you need an uh, exposure, the projects you need to have undertaken a couple of projects, good test course, that is for GRE, TOEFL, in case of USA, that is. Uh, you, if you have published papers, you would have to show them. Dissertations, if you have carried out any dissertation for your uh, PG and for your MPhil, if you have done MPhil, that is. And they also look for co-curricular activities whether, you know, they look for all-round development. Uh, it's not merely the research area that they are looking for. They also look for, you know, uh, all-round development. So, so they're also looking for co-curricular activities. But yes, interestingly, 
relevant to your chosen research area which are relevant to your chosen research area and then you need recommendation from your professors and a very strong statement of purpose that is what they call sop or sop statement of purpose it has to be very strong your objectives what you wish to do what is it that you wish to research about and why you wish to do it all right so these are the requirements for overseas research application process you need to be very thorough uh, it has to be a good application a sound application because that is what introduces you to a foreign country your application introduces you so naturally it has to be a very sound application your academic record speaks you know for what you have achieved already huh? it is not always that marks say everything but marks also have a certain value and this is your record because this is what you produce when you go abroad this is what you have done your language scores because you need to have good communication skills the letters of recommendation from your professors uh, the teachers and your professors who have guided you in your thesis in your dissertation etc the research proposal the work that you are going to carry out and this is the critical part of the whole thing because this showcases your approach your outlook your perspective and of course your communication and your writing skill this will make a lot of difference and of course the letter of motivation that is your letter of purpose now you could go to all these countries you could just choose usa uk france germany you have to make your choice you have to see where you know you're getting the institute of your choice your fellowship and where people are you know uh, you find that it's going to be conducive for your life ahead they could have a phd entrance exam so if they have a phd entrance exam you've got to crack that too that would you know uh, differ from one institute to another there's Uh, uh, no really universal rule on that but i have tried to give you a general view of the whole thing now you could go with phd support abroad that is you could go with phd support of a uh, three types that is for teaching assistantship you can uh, go you can teach a section of, of of that particular course in exchange for the salary huh? they might give you a, a teaching assistantship or they can give you a research assistantship in that case you can help a teacher a faculty member in this field of research and he be giving you a salary or you could get a fellowship that is offered by a particular university or by some external agency to support your doctoral studies so the assistance could be of three types and you have to avail some kind of funding because phd if anything at all research if anything is a possible affair so you need to have money in your hands to carry out research now the pros and cons well the joy of discovery it's new varied innovative challenging dynamic a sense of fulfillment and you are working on your own you are your own master because you develop your work but of course you know it also depends on your mentor uh, because uh, if he gives you freedom to work then that's fine or else you'll be in a deep trouble then for the cons it's heavily dependent on the grants grant is very important it's a time consuming affair and since this is an ongoing process age could be a barrier for switching over because if at any point you feel that you wish to change to some other career you know age might become a bar so you have to be very careful before you choose on research as a career points to ponder would be your security and your career prospects how secured are you whether it is a permanent research position because permanent research positions are few in number so you know there are most people are either teaching with research as a subsidiary people like me we are teaching with a fixed salary and with research as a subsidiary you know for uh, that we get the oxygen from research so the career prospects because you know you might be thrown out of your team 
after you age, after a certain age, when they get the new people, and then you find that it's too late to switch to other jobs. So you have to be very careful when you actually choose research as a career. It is competitive. I have emphasized this. Employment in other areas will be restricted because after you've got all those degrees to yourself, you would not feel uh, you would not feel like you know switching to any other profession. If they ask you to do something else, you know, go into business or you know do something else, you will not feel like it. Perhaps you would have to travel and relocate if you're researching. Because one lab may be in West Bengal, the other may be in Delhi, the other may be in Bangalore, the other may be abroad. So it could be a lot of travel and relocation. But you would be independent. The hours could be flexible if you have a good guide. You're always working in your area of interest. And the pandemic scenario could have altered all this. Because for the last two years, there is not much funding available because of the pandemic. So, you have to be very careful before you set sail. Now, you know, I take that you have chosen research as your career, you've gone ahead, you've got your PhD. So, at the end of five years, the researcher is well on her way to establishing herself. You're highly motivated and You've attended refresher courses, you've gone to seminars, you've gone to workshops, and you're skilled in computers. So five years, you're a thorough professional. Ten years later, you're even better. You have a decade of research to your credit. You're perhaps in one of the top most positions uh, in your organization. And if you're in academics, then possibly, you know, it, you would get a tenured post that is a permanent post. Uh, uh, here we get permanent posts right away, but abroad it's not that easy. Only your research will uh, matter whether you get a tenured post or not. So maybe at the end of 10 years, you are a tenured professor or you could be the departmental head and you have a whole body of research material, books, articles, you know, to show for yourself. So at the end of 10 years and thereafter, you are an accomplished researcher. And finally, research is passion. You have to be very passionate about it. Well, here's then to years of fruitful and sustainable research to all of you. For me, I would always say, once a researcher, always a researcher. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, madam, for such an excellent deliberation actually the process of think tank not only inspires students but also scholars as well so uh, with this i would request professor uh, priyanka roy and professor debobrodo chondo to take over the question answer session thank you ma'am i'm audible am i audible yes yes, yes you are audible yes audible. Uh, Ma'am, we had uh, like we received several questions, but due to time constraints, we have selected uh, two questions. The first one, Ma'am, goes like this: that uh, we have so many online resources now available to us. Like whenever we uh, Google something, we get so much of online resources. So in this case, what are the things that a researcher should keep in his or her mind when, like before, um, including those as a part of their literature review or a part of their study? Yes, you know, I always suggest uh, the people to read the papers from journals the, instead of just, you know, uh, getting the information from Wikipedia or merely copying and pasting, you know, the data and the information. It is always better that you get your information from the papers which are published in journals. You could download the PDF. The students could download and the teachers might guide them to do the same. They could download the papers and, uh, well, they could just get their information from the different papers because there are experimental papers, there are review papers, there are papers of all kinds. Nowadays, you know, there are journals which also uh, uh, ask the students to uh, publish their, dissert, their dissertation and their projects so they could even read from those uh, papers but not the general until and unless it's a trusted website unless uh, until and unless you know those 
uh, you know, online stuff is verified. I don't think that you could quote them in your research work. Definitely, you could not. Okay, ma'am. Thank you. And uh, one more question: How to become a freelance researcher in India, uh, ma'am? Can you just mention some sources where we can enroll in uh, one such? You know, freelancing would be uh, yes. It's difficult because it depends on your field. Because as a science freelancer, then you'll have to take something that is not lab based. Uh, but uh, for the social sciences, humanities, it will not be a problem. But yes, there are plenty of, you know, uh, journals. In fact, I know people who are writing and, you know, they send in their papers uh, to different journals, to different newspapers, to different, you know, uh, to these e-signs that we have, to the uh, web journals that we have, to the uh, the published ones also we have. So we could, you know, uh, as a freelancer, you could try the different online and uh, the offline journals as well, the newspapers, the periodicals, you can start writing there. But it would be difficult, I think, especially for the people who are doing lab-based work. The others could have a go. The others could have a go. Because there are plenty of, you know, options if you just search the net there are so many especially uh, related to environment there are so many of these sites who are willing to you know the ones who publish uh, you know poetry and prose are willing to publish articles on environment so uh, since i'm into a bit of poetry writing these days i know that uh, you know uh, the people who are uh, publishing poetry and prose and fiction are also publishing uh, articles in science and uh, they have their ISSN and, and all that. So it's not a problem. You could just give in your articles there. Thank you so much, ma'am, for answering the questions. Thank uh, you. Thank, thank you, you so much. much. Over to the anchors. Thank you. Thank you so much to Shupatra, ma'am, for her enthralling speech. And to Priyanka, ma'am, and Devabrita, sir, for conducting the two question answer sessions with her. And we are in the fag end of today's program. And I am requesting Dr. Parikit Dr. Sir to give the vote of thanks and <clears throat> officially end today's first day webinar. Uh, thank you, Jebusuti, madam. Uh, good evening. On behalf of the conveners team, I would uh, like to convey my thanks to Ashtosh College administration particularly respected uh, Vice Principal Sir, Professor Abdul respected Pastor Sir, Professor Manush Kobi, um, so, uh, IQSE and IQSE Coordinator, Professor Shripona Dr. Roy. I thank uh, our mentor, Professor Shaujal Bhattacharya Sir, for his guidance and, um, uh, and inputs. And I also want to thank the seminar committee uh, thanks to Professor Rishi Bhattacharya for uh, the artistic support and Professor Supio Dash, HOD BBA, for academic support. Uh, we are honored to have three eminent speakers today. Uh, in today's session. I would like to convey our gratitude and thanks to our honorable speakers, uh, Mr. J.V. Bhaskar, uh, Mr. Shuja Banerjee, and Professor Shupatra Shain for their inspiring and enriching talks. Uh, the students... Um, uh, are deeply uh, uh, inspired by your uh, talk. I would also like to thank uh, Debushri Dashkupto, uh, Madam, and Priyanka Mukherjee, Madam, for anchoring uh, Priyanka Roy, Mihalakto, Madam, and Devroto Chondo, Sir, for uh, moderating the sessions. Uh, thank you to the students again for their participation and for posting thoughtful questions and the interactions. Uh, thanks to Sri Shumnath Dash, uh, Sri Shumon uh, Chongar, Srimoti Omrita Dotto, and Srimoti Deepa Shen for technical support to conduct this webinar. Uh, without their help, this would be a difficult job. Uh, lastly, I would like to thank all my fellow members of the Career Counseling and Training Program team uh, for their inputs and efforts and our coordinator, uh, Professor Chandra Mulishen Gupta Madam, for her continuous guidance. Hope uh, you 
all had an enriching in evening today uh, thank you for joining us we will meet you all again tomorrow at 5 pm for another academic session with three other honorable speakers till then uh, we are done for the day so good night